Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> Well, everyone, we are here for episode number two. We are here. We're right here, in fact. Right, right here in uh, Missoula, Montana. Yeah, rainy Missoula. You are? In Missoula as well. I am Corey Jacobson. And I am <laughs> Randy Newberg. And this is the Elk Talk Podcast with Corey and Randy, presented by... The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Who is so kind enough to let us come out of the rain and use this little room here in the... Uh, we got a It's a, a serious, pretty sweet room. It's a sweet room, but I got to tell you, folks, if you hear like a a continual drone that sounds like wind noise... Or that sounds like the jets on a airplane. <clears throat> yeah, it's the air conditioner that runs in here all day, every day, is all I can figure. Yeah, which it's surprising to have a sound room with... With that a, much air movement in here, but it would get awful hot, especially with these lights on. Yeah, I'm I'm thankful that that. Hey, what's the saying? Beggars can't be choosers. Yeah. So to that, or sitting out in your Honda Pilot with the rain beating on the roof of it, <laughs> that would probably be more distracting. So, uh, so here's a <clears throat> funny story. We're trying to do two podcasts in one day. So we did podcast number one this morning. Corey and I go to lunch in my, we drive over to the pizza joint in my Honda Pilot. <clears throat> We're sitting there eating pizza and I'm looking for my <laughs> shirt pocket. And if those of you who watch episode number one look closely, no, I didn't go and change shirts. <laughs> what happened is this morning, I got up at 4.30 this morning, took a shower. It's dark. I didn't want to wake up my wife and the dog. So I'm doing everything in the dark. I put my shirt on inside out and nobody tells me. I, I seriously sat here and during the recording of podcast number one, and I'm looking at your shirt going, that's a sharp looking shirt. I wonder who makes it. And I didn't see any logos on it or anything. Yeah. And I looked and I saw the Sitka logo on the back, you know, at the nape of the neck there. And I thought, that's yeah. a weird place for a logo. And then I realized it also <laughs> says the size and everything else there. Because <laughs> Corey's like, what, what, what model is that? I'm like, oh, it's the TTW stuff. I don't know what model it is, but it's <laughs> travel, train, work, and put it on inside out. So... <laughs> Those of you who are watching this on YouTube, uh, you'll definitely notice that the the inside seams are now on the inside. I think that's what caught your attention was the seams were so right. obvious there on the outside. Yeah, yeah, they were sticking out. I'm like, what, I tear a hole in my shirt or what's the deal? <clears throat> Anyhow. So if you didn't catch that in episode one, go back and watch it on YouTube. <laughs> or I conveniently have some video footage of Randy uh, putting his shirt on the correct way in the uh, restaurant. Uh, yeah, I'm sure the waitress is like, I'm supposed to serve food to these <laughs> Do guys? I need to actually feed you the food too? <laughs> what is up with these guys? So anyhow, episode number one, we told the world what the Elk Talk podcast is going to be about. Yep. Or at least gave them some general ideas. Mostly we rambled on. I was going to say, we went down many rabbit holes, so they at least have an understanding of what to expect. Yeah. So we're going to get through the whole presented by sponsorship, all the places you can find us, watch us, uh, stuff like that. And we're going to get right into what we left podcast number one with. We both listed off our five most common mistakes that, or mistakes we've made. Yeah. And Maybe. I think mistakes that 
we feel, if you overcome them, will contribute most to your success. Yeah. Well, they were once I realized my mistakes and then figured out, okay, I, I got to solve this. Those were the largest steps yep. towards finally killing an elk for me. Totally. So, but what was that noise? Uh, it's probably a phone going off. And... Oh. <laughs> oh, well, Corey's got his phone on like I... super vibrate or something. Well, yeah. Twenty dollars to, wake to the me kitty. Up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Corey's on some new diet. He's he's denounced all kinds of things. I don't know. I think he ate the napkin at lunch. Or no, something. it has paper product in it. I can't eat paper product. Oh really? Okay, not me. I just went for the <laughs> old pizza, man. Load it up. I did too, but it was gluten free pizza with some sort of white cream sauce. Different sauce because tomato sauce is acidic, and yeah. We can talk about that another are time. You, we don't want to bore are you, our listeners. Are you, are you going to medical school or something, or what? I am getting a PhD in uh, nutrition yes. and diet, or what? yes, uh, really. I'm going to oh. live forever. Elk hunting is too much fun to mm. to miss out on it. So. I don't want to live forever. I've seen <laughs> what forever looks like. I don't want to live that long. <clears throat> but so before anyhow. we get into sponsors, why do we have yeah. sponsors? Can't we just do this without sponsors? Well. People would like for us to do this without sponsors, but when you consider how much it costs to produce this, pay an editor, buy equipment, travel to places, host guests, everything else, um, I already do all my video production, YouTube channel, Amazon stuff as a nonprofit. I don't need another nonprofit. If this just breaks even, <laughs> my wife will be happy. Totally. Because my wife, when we sit down and talk about, you know, whether this is a job or a problem, she says, you know, most of the time you don't have to buy a job. Yeah. I don't know if you get There's, that. But. No, no. I mean, it's as long as you're making income, mm -hmm. that's separate from a job. We talked about that in the last right. episode, but okay. we're, uh, we're not in the business of necessarily making an income from the podcast. Right. But we're also not in the business of losing, losing money, money from right. it. And, <laughs> and I think it's important as you hear the sponsors that are a part of the podcast for the listeners these are companies that we support. This isn't us out looking for a handout from anybody. These right. are companies that we've tried and proven it. So it's, as we shared, it's natural for us to share them. It's not unnatural. We aren't reading from a script saying, oh, company A, this is good because, oh, look, they released a new product. Let's talk about that. The, yeah. we're, we're talking about these companies because we support them. In turn, they support us. Right. And the real benefit here is everybody gets to listen to the podcast for free because of it. For free. That's right. And they all have all these cool promo codes. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why we are happy to have these companies. Uh, and for me, I'm looking at them all. I've been working with them all for a long time. Yep. I think Napoleon was a cadet when I first started working with Onyx Maps. <laughs> Moby Dick was a minnow when you first started working with Sitka Gear. Oh, yes, indeed. So, I mean, it's hopefully people understand that yep. you and I aren't the guys that for love or money will hop here and jump around there. Nope. So, but before we get into the sponsor stuff, people can leave their comments on our Instagram page, which, which is, is at Elk, Elk Talk, Talk Podcast. Podcast. Not dot com. No dot coms, no hashtag okay. anything. All we right. should have hashtag elk talk podcast. So should we? Yeah. Maybe if somebody wants to suggest a topic or a theme or a question or something, they could hashtag elk talk podcast and that way we would check for those hashtags and we could see all three people who have a, a comment or a suggestion. So when I asked my my younger crew members what's a hashtag, they showed it to me. It was the pound sign when I right. grew up. Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah, I heard a, something somebody called in, and I don't remember if it was a 911 call or something, and there was some confusion between the pound sign. They were saying, did you push number four pound or whatever? And like, no. And come to find out, they were pushing the hashtag on the phone, <laughs> not the pound sign. So. Uh, and then we have the website that talks about this podcast, gives people places to listen to it online if they don't want to download it. Yep. And that is www.elktalkpodcast.com. You got it. Wow. Yeah. We've only had Wouldn't it be easier it. if we just had www.elktalk.com? I know. We talked Man. about that in the last podcast, but we can't get that dude to give up his domain name. His family vacation from the 80s that he's yeah. holding on to the picture. <laughs> Again, there's a commission involved that somebody can convince him 
that uh, we should have that domain name, but right now we're going with Elk Talk Podcast. Yep. And we'll we'll just call that good for right now. But the thing we got to talk about is we said at the beginning that this is presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And uh, their mission is ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Yeah. And at the end of this, we're going to talk about, not at the end end, but throughout this, there's a place we're going to talk about what the Elk Foundation does tangibly. Like, you can go and hunt here, or because of their work, there are more elk here, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, everybody should be a member. Everybody. Any elk hunter that carries an elk tag should carry an Elk Foundation membership. Right. R-M-E-F dot O-R-G. Click on the membership tab. Or the donate tab. Yep. Donate often and donate generously. Yep. And if you do communicate with them and you became a member because of this podcast, let them know. So they don't think that them letting us kind of... Barge into their yeah, sound room here. Yeah, to get out of the rain was without any value. That's right. So, But no, it's, it's, it is important. <laughs> and that's, we were talking about it at lunch that they put so much into things we don't see. Even during mm -hmm. elk season, we might go out and not realize the Elk Foundation's hand in what we're experiencing during elk season. Yeah. But there are so many things with winter range and all of that that is so critical to us enjoying that week in the fall of, of chasing these awesome animals. And I think $35 for any of us, if we are elk hunters, seriously look into right. being a member. <clears throat> Plus the best outdoor magazine out there. You look at what has happened to, uh, nothing against my friends in print media, but print has become mostly advertising and a couple pretty pictures in most magazines. Bugle Magazine is serious reading material. Dan and his crew here at Bugle Magazine, that's a high quality magazine. Yeah. And you get that for free as a member. Right. It's one of the benefits. Yeah. So we're going to do this, the list in reverse this time. Ooh. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is a company you've worked with for a little while. Wait, yes. were, were you like an indentured servant to them you know, when they first so it's, started? It's funny, and I have a 15-year-old now, a teenager. So looking back, I can see some of my traits showing through in him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I wanted nothing to do with a call company uh -huh. because I saw what went into it. My dad literally sitting there with a 1970s TV tray with all of these diaphragm frames on it watching TV as he's gluing, you know, the tabs of the latex there and stretching them and everything every night until nine o'clock at night. Wow. You know, and he started, he was still logging and outfitting and doing some other stuff when he started the call business. And that was, gosh, I don't even remember. I was in high school, maybe 90, I don't know, 90, 91, huh. somewhere in there that he, you know, kind of ramped it up and... Anyway, yeah, I've, I was uh, never really an indentured servant. I was more of really? a obstinate <laughs> teenager that wanted nothing to do with it. I just told him, make the best elk calls in the world so I can use them, but I don't want to have to be involved in making them. Uh, well, anyhow, if you go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or if you have the old URL that I have in my uh, shortcuts, my bookmarks, BuglingBull.com and use promo code ELKTALK, E L K. T A L K. You did that without looking. I good know. Job. <clears throat> That's pretty good for a guy like me. <laughs> uh, they're going to give you 15% off any purchases that our listeners make That's out huge. on their website. Yeah. 15% is like, man. Especially if you lose as many calls in a year as I do, they fall out of my pocket. <laughs> camera guys steal them. I loan them to somebody else. I don't know how many times I'll tell one of the camera guys, oh, yeah, it's in this container. They shuffle through there. Oh, yeah. And either they steal it or they lose it. We can't find it, but yeah. their pockets are full when they walk away. Right. Yeah. I'm like, what did you do with those when I told you where to get them? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I put them back in there. <laughs> They're not there. You want to borrow mine? I've got four of them here. Yeah. They yeah. slobber all over them and say, oh, you want it now? Yep. So anyhow, great folks, great calls. I mean, it, I'm, I'm wondering like, if, if I practiced enough because I'm using their calls, am I... In the running to win a World Elk Calling Championship? Absolutely. In fact, it's guaranteed. 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 Wow. As long yep. as the, it's a contest of one, I'm going to win. I guarantee you will win an elk calling contest if you use their calls. Wow. Yep. I'll judge it even. 
<laughs> Corey will say, what's the one that sounds like someone's slammed his dog's <laughs> tail in the door? Oh, that's Newberg. Yeah. In today's society, everyone's a winner, Andy. Really? I'll yep. get a participation you trophy. You will be a winner. All, All right. right. Well, there you have it, folks. And then we've got GoHunt.com. Um, the reason I have, I, I say this year, my cup runneth over when it comes to tags is... I, I I talked to Chris and Lorenzo and those guys at Go Hunt, and I told them how much time I really spend on the site. And I think at first they were kidding. Then one day Chris calls me. He's like, "You aren't <laughs> kidding. We looked at how many hours you're on Go Hunt." Insider. You were number one. Uh, I think he did say you that. Were, he, I heard it on a podcast that you were the number one user of Go Hunt Insider. <laughs> uh, well. It's just a place where all of the information I need is in one spot. No yep. longer going and getting this news article from 1998 and this magazine article I cut out in 2004 and some old outdated Forest Service map, blah, blah, blah. No, it's all there. It's at my fingertips. They have their strategy articles. They have everything I need, the best draw odds. And if they use, if, if our listeners use promo code Elk Talk. Wait, there's a promo code there too? Yeah, wow. uh, we're like promo code. It's that is like awesome. an addiction I have. It's kind of like, you know, <laughs> how every time a group of hunters get together, there's got to be a raffle. Yep. I think with our podcast, there's just got to be a promo there's code. There's got to be a promo code. Yeah. So right now they've got a 30-day free trial going on. I think it's mostly for the month of July, but yep. may, who knows? Maybe they'll extend it if it's in such high demand. But and you know, just for get... anyone listening, we're talking July of 2018. Right. Randy and I did a, a video clip, what, two years ago or something and gave a promotion code on that. Mm-hmm. I still get emails from that. This code doesn't work. Yeah. It's two years old. <laughs> so the 30-day free trial at Go mm-hmm. Hunt is July of 2018. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yep. <clears throat> Definitely and, sign up. Yeah, and it's for the insider, which is what we're talking about. It you go to the website gohunt.com, click on the insider tab and take advantage of the 30-day free trial. And if you decide to keep it and sign up, use promo code Elk Talk, and they're gonna give you fifty dollars of free credit, like mad money, like yeah. almost the equivalent of cash. Go spend it on well, you don't have to spend a minimum amount, you get fifty dollars right. in their gear store. Right. And that's a really, really good gear store. So then the, the next one we have who sponsors and supports the question of the week, which we'll get to later, is Sitka Gear. Yeah. Turning clothing into gear. Yeah. That's been their slogan for uh, a what, long 12 time. years now. Uh, whatever. They and are. I, you know, I'd, I would contest that they are the leader in mm-hmm. technical clothing for hunters yeah. and continue to push that and evolve it. Yeah. Well, for me, it's just, well, I think about how many days, and usually when me and me or the crew, when we get talking, uh, I or the crew, me or the crew, whatever. I the crew and I. The crew and I. I it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, where I grew up, you know, <laughs> it's funny. We, we were in Alaska la- two weeks ago, and we did uh, a segment about cooking brats around the fire, and there's a... I, I have all this inside joke stuff and you forget that when you say or do something a certain way, the rest of the world doesn't know the inside <laughs> joke. And so I call that jalapenos instead of jalapeno. And a bunch of people are like, jalapeno. I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell them about. So <laughs> is that a new vegetable? Right. And so a lot of times I say things that are a word that my family is kind of Archie Bunkered by. They, they, it sounds similar, but they use a different word like Archie Bunker used to. So anyhow, uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that. But I'm not other, either. Other but... than when I was saying that me and I and the crew and trying to figure out the English of that, yeah. uh, the grammar, whatever. Uh, whenever we talk about how many days we've been out in the field. We quit counting when we get to 100. It doesn't matter after that. And when you spend that much time from hot August hunts to cold December hunts in all conditions, you need gear that works. There's no no amount of love or money going to get me to use something where I'm going to be miserable. Yeah, you realize how how valuable it is and how good it is. Yeah, if, if you if you've ever w- wished you saved money on something or that you went the cheap route and said, "Oh, I'll just buy a new this next year and a new one the next year," 
It will not be when you're sitting on a Wyoming mountain in November glassing <laughs> elk when it's 10 degrees and the wind is blowing 25 miles an hour. And you've sweated your whole way up the mountain, 2,500 feet. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to be sitting there and you're going to have your Calvin Light jacket with your Timberline pants on and your Jetstream jacket. And you're going to be like, oh, man. But with that being said, it's important to make sure that you're buying the right gear for the True. style of hunting. I've had people right. call and say, I bought this Sitka jacket and it is horrible. I roasted. I, I bought, you know, I sweated the whole time. Well, they bought a duck hunting parka <laughs> to go chase elk at 12,000 feet in September in Colorado. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's definitely functional gear that is built for specific use and a purpose. Yeah. So then we got Gerber gear, which is, I'm, I'm trying to think when I first got a Gerber knife a long, long time ago. Uh, actually, we were hunting this year. Uh, with a guy named Gerald Martin from Trout Creek, Montana. And his, he and his two boys were with us in eastern Montana, and they each shot whitetails. And Gerald's like me, man. When something hits the ground, he's got his carving tools out. Boy, he's just getting after it. And I looked, I'm like, Gerald, that looks like one of the original Gator <laughs> premiums. And he's like, yeah. I said, when did you get that? He said, I don't know, 95, something like that. I, and I, don't, I, he didn't know what date, but he said, if I ever lose this, I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> uh, and it's a Gerber Gator, old style. Um, and I use their vitals, their, their new big game vital. Uh, I was over meeting with their engineers in May for two days and their design people coming up with new ideas. They, they're like, will you go test this? Will you try that test? Mm, sure. I'll I'll try anything. <laughs> and uh, so they got some really cool people there. I got my second factory tour. I, I don't know. You, you're an engineer. You see that movie, How It's Made, or not the movie, the series on TV, How huh. It's Made? Oh, it's like how everything is manufactured. I could sit and watch episodes of that That's forever. Cool. Yeah. And then to go to Gerber and get to see how all this stuff is made, it's like, wow, this is like the the episode or the series, How It's Made, but like audience yeah. style. So, uh, GerberGear.com, go there. Uh, their line of hunting products is really, really good. And when you're out this year, use their Vital, Big Game Vital, or their Gator Premium, and you're going to be glad you did. Uh, last one, Corey, one that you've known a long time also is Onyx Maps. Yeah. They're, uh, they're just down the road here. Yeah. Why didn't we invite them over? Probably because we're... Distracted enough with just the two of us. <laughs> if anybody else in here, we would get uh, nothing done. Yeah, but they got a promo code also. Of course they do. And what do you suppose that promo code is? Uh, if I'm looking at your notes correctly, it looks like it's <laughs> Elk Talk. Elk Talk. Yeah. And you get 20% off their app products. A lot of people are like, all right, how, how do you haunt these? Well, first of all, they say, how do you guys draw so many tanks? And I'm, I don't know about you, but in most instances, I'm not applying for the, what I call glory yeah. tags. I'm applying for maybe the average or the overlooked or slightly above average, depending on how many points I have. And just about every one of those tags I apply for have a complication of public private interface. There's a reason why people aren't applying for right. those tags. Yeah. I love how Wyoming helps me. They put a little asterisk by yeah. the hunt code that says access is difficult here. Idaho's the same way. Limited oh, access. Really? Yeah. You guys do that too? Yeah. Oh, well, I can assure you every place I have at, that people have ever seen us film in uh, Wyoming with maybe the exception of one or two hunts. Look for the asterisk. There was an <laughs> asterisk by that that said difficult access. And how do we solve that? Oh, with the Onyx system. Yep. Without it? At uh, your fingertips now. And that's you know, we talked last episode, I'm a slow technology learner, but right here on my phone, I have the whole app and I can download multiple states. So right. I'm here in Montana today. I don't live in Montana, but I have the Montana maps on my phone and I can see who owns this property that we're sitting on. I can see who owns as I'm driving by and realize, you know what, there's a whole lot of private and all these barns and orange paint everywhere. There's a little sliver of public access right there where I can slip between all that and get up behind all the private and hunt it. That right. Without that app, yeah, people drive right by. Yeah, I, I don't know how, <laughs> how I would hunt the way I do now without the Onyx system. Yep. I'd be, 
I'd just be SOL. I'd, <laughs> I'd be out in the cold. I'd be on the in, outside looking in, whatever term you want to put to it. Or I'd be like everybody else applying for these really hard to draw units because yeah. I know there's all public land there. And that's all great, but I want to hunt more. Yep. So on X helps me hunt more. Yep. 20% off on the app products. That's Use awesome. Promo code elk talk. And that's at onxmaps.com. Even though I think that on Instagram they're on X hunt, right? Yeah, they have on X hunt, on X app, on X maps, but okay. you'll got, find them. Yeah, they got on X a lot of things. So from last podcast, I was taking notes. You see that? See that, folks watching on YouTube? It doesn't look like notes. That's a red pen. That's correction. Oh, I know. You've been I, correcting what I said, and now you're going to. I, I always write with a red pen. I don't know why. I just do. Other than when I do a signature. I was told that the the ink of the business world is black. Huh. And then I got told by an attorney who specializes in fraud, no, you want to use blue ink. Oh. so It's harder to make a yeah. black and white copy of it. There you go. Yeah. And uh, so, anyhow, all that red stuff right there is notes okay. that gave our five top elk hunting mistakes, problems, challenges, hurdles to overcome. Because we said in the first episode, the whole purpose of whatever we do here is to lower the hurdles, give information to make people more successful. Yep. So who's going to start? Let's start with you. Why don't you uh, uh, <clears throat> give us your... Let's go backwards. Go backwards. Start yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save the really good... Well, I'm going to start with the most obvious one when I start. Okay. But I'm going to save the real piece of golden information for the last one. Okay. So, what, you, which of my five on that list do you want me to start with? Oh, I have to pick the one. Out. Can you, you probably can't even read my Let's writing. Let's see. That says, <clears throat> hoping for luck. Oh, lack. Lack of... Lack of a <laughs> lack of a plan is what number two is. Number three is something about check, <clears throat> the wind. Checklist winds. Yeah, your writing is careless oh, with the wind. Careless with winds. <laughs> number four is emphasis on gadgets. Number five is afraid to experiment, and number one is lack of understanding of elk. Let's talk about wind. Wind. All yeah. right. Since that's your number one and my number three. We could have a, this could be a whole conversation about wind. Yeah. So uh, I'll start with people who don't grow up in the West are accustomed to the wind being consistent from one direction all day long. I, you go set a stand. We, we've got a southeast wind this morning. We need to set this stand because it's going to be the same wind all day. Right. And I always thought, that when I heard these terms thermals when I moved out west, I'm like, what are they talking about? They, oh, I know. They must just be talking about how the the heat, you know, I thought it was like the mirage effect. I was thinking that's what thermals <laughs> were because if you look in your oven, you see the radiating. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's pretty thermal. <laughs> <laughs> that's how simple I was. But I get a lot of emails from people saying, can you tell me more about thermals? We don't have them where I live. So last year in Arizona, on day four, I think it was, uh, we had uh, Lucas and Carson from Gerber with us. They were on one side of the knob. Me and Jerry had the tag. He and, and Michael and I were on the other side. And Lucas came, or yeah, Lucas came and got me. He's like, hey, Carson's got two bulls bedded over here. So I walk over there like 30 yards away. I look and yeah, there's two bulls bedded there. And we are downwind across a canyon from them. Everything is just fine. And we're getting the spotters all set up. And there's a road up above the canyon back behind these elk. So we're kind of to the east. The elk are west of us. And the road is even further west of them. And all of a sudden, these two bulls get up. And they look up the hill. And they just take off. I'm like, what the heck? Probably 30 minutes later, this is morning. I mean, it's just not long after the sun had been up. Here comes two hunters walking up to the lip of the canyon and kind of down the nose, where to the lip of the canyon and then down the nose into the canyon. Well, that thermal was going downhill because it was morning, it's cold, the heavier air is sinking. And these guys had no idea that 
here they are. They're walking in with the thermal at their back. Yeah. We got to see it. We got to film it, everything. And before we left that day, I said, all right, I, this is a, a great observation of how thermals can be misunderstood or, or just lack of. Right. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't grow up with them, you, you don't know. Some people think they can beat the thermal or they can uh, somehow cut corners and get by <laughs> with it. Well, not with these two bulls. They were both nice bulls. They're, they've been to a few rodeos. They were bedded there for a reason. They knew in the morning the road was up wind from them and anyone coming from that road they're going to smell them yep. before the hunter ever sees them so we did a whole video out on our youtube channel about how thermals work and there happened to be this really big slanted flat rock right there i was like man what a great prop here <laughs> so that was my most recent uh observation or, or example among hundreds of, of my own, making this mistake myself so many times about wind and about thermals. Yep. And so what's, what's the mistake you listed it as one of the top five mistakes? What is the mistake people make when it comes to wind? I, I don't think they give it enough respect. I think everyone is of the opinion that a whitetail, you can't fool his nose, but every, every other species, ah, uh, you can get a little bit careless. Well, uh, that's not my experience. And when you and I hunted in Montana, uh, I, you take it to a new level because I know there were a couple times mid-morning when those thermals are kind of not really consistent downhill because it's getting later, but not yep. warm enough yet that they're consistent uphill. We'd start, we'd hear, hear an elk bill and you start moving in and you're consistent, you, yeah. You hunt with your wind checker in one hand and your call in the other. I don't know. What do you do with your bow in the interim? It's usually I'm just carrying it by the string in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, many times I'm like, oh, man, we're within 100, 150 yards. This is going to get close. And all of a sudden you take us on a three-quarter mile loop. <laughs> I'm like, what, Corey just want to go sightseeing? I could tell him what it looks like. I've hunted this drainage before. You know, if, <laughs> if you want to know, I can tell you. But then watching the way you're running your wind checker. There was no doubt that you got close. He's like, ooh, I'm not going to take a chance with yeah. the wind. And it might take us an hour to get closer. But I, maybe there's some times on that hunt that we blew something out by wind, but I, I don't, I yeah, don't recall any. You know, wind is, is one of those things that is out of our control. As yeah. far as the thermals are going to do what they do, and we can't control them. But there are a lot of things we can do to control their effect on our hunt. And I think, you know, just looking at an area, I can get on Google Earth and look and you can see if you understand thermals in the morning, like you'd mentioned, are coming down. The ground is cool. It's pulling the air down. And then as the sun hits the ground, it starts warming it up. That thermal on an open hillside as the sun rays hit it are going to switch. And they're yeah. going to switch 180 degrees. They're either coming down or up. It's an up or down thing. And if you get cloud cover or if you get competing thermals, there will be some swirling. And that can happen, especially in high country where it swirls, it's continually struggling. You get higher elevation, it's cooler weather up there. The, the ground has a, it holds the, the cool air longer. And so as the sun's hitting it, it's just competing. So you have those, those forces competing. And just understanding the up and down effects of the thermals, my whole goal with calling in an elk is to get on the same level as the elk. And we're talking same elevation elevation level, okay? Because the thermals are usually going perpendicular to elevation, so they're either going mostly uphill or mostly downhill. Yep. So you feel comfortable if you're at the same elevation, that thermal will be perpendicular kind of right to my movement. Okay. Yeah. So right angle, and what happens then is there's been so many times myself, I've been following an elk up the mountain, and the thermals are in my face, just hundred percent in my favor. And I get right up close to this elk and we get set up and the elk's kind of stalling there in this area. And all of a sudden I feel the wind right at my back, 180 degree, hundred percent change in direction. And I'll talk more about that, but there's a reason why that elk stopped there. Right. There's a reason for the timing. <laughs> Everything happens there. But if we're coming in perpendicular or from the same elevation as the elk, when the thermals do switch, it's not taking your scent straight to the elk. It's taking it 90 degrees away from him. And with your scent cone fanning out, 
the chances of you getting winded, even if the wind switches 180 degrees, is minimized. So, huh. you know, that's one thing that can help overcome the uncontrollable effect of thermals. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I could list all kinds of examples here, but I hunt a lot of sanctuary areas, I call them, in, in the post-rut season, which I say is usually October 10th, 15th-ish is kind of when the mature bulls just say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going to get through another hunting season, yep. and they go into some ugly places. Just about every sanctuary has there they are they identify that as a sanctuary for a reason and and wind is one of those reasons they you'll see these bachelor groups in november there's three bulls and you're like why do they pick that little spot compared to four other places that look kind of similar and then you try to get into it and you realize why right because <laughs> you you're sneaking in there you're trying to get in there and maybe it's noisy but it's always got some screwed up wind situation where no matter what angle you come from, there's a really good chance that they're going to be able to wind you. And those sanctuaries usually have a really quick escape route yeah. that three steps and boom, they're in the dark timber or they're bailed off the other side or something. So I don't know how many times I've screwed up a spot and stock thing on bedded elk that I've found in a sanctuary and thought, no, I just want to get a little closer. I just want to get a little closer. All right. If I get to that knob right there, I'll be at 250. And I get there and the wind does what you're talking about. And it's like, I know they didn't hear me. No. I know they didn't see me. I was completely out of sight. What? Oh, why did they, all I heard was hoofs yep. beating the ground. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's, I don't know how well, many just, of those just examples. Just picture, you know, a draw, and say you have three draws that come down and meet at one point. Mm -hmm. Well, if the thermals are coming down, if you're an elk and you bet at the base of that one point where all three of those come together, anything approaching from any of those three ridges or draws, you're going to smell. Right. And those are some of the sanctuaries you talk about. They, they get in these areas where all these points converge, and they're protected almost 180 degrees from anything approaching anywhere. Yep. And you get on this ridge and you, you think, okay, he's bedded on the adjacent ridge. I'm going to slip down here. And pretty soon, as you have your puffer bottle in your hand, you get down close and realize the thermals are actually pulling over the ridge right there and right down to where he's bedded. And that's why we back out and spend the next hour and a half trying to find the, the next best approach. Yeah. No, a lot of times anymore, and this is because of how many times I've screwed it up. If I see elk bedded somewhere or I know they're in there, and it's this weird period of the day where the thermals can't make up their mind or I'm on a hillside that the sun is hitting and they're on a shaded hillside or whatever it might be, I will wait for an hour or two hours until those thermals are more consistent. I hate that period in yeah. the morning from like 9, 9.30 till about 10.30, 11, because it's just mixing back and forth. I was going to ask you to touch on that, so I'm glad you did. It, what is it that causes that? It's just the fact that hot air rises. So as the sun rays heats the, the, the ground and the surface, the air itself rise, it warms and it rises. Well, then you got shaded areas that don't have the same temperature. So all of that air is cooler and it's heavier. And it's, it's just like watching this mixing a vortex bowl. Of, yeah. yeah. And so the same later in the evening, just before, when that... When the sun goes behind the, the horizon, I love it because the animals are out, right? Yep. It's that beautiful, you probably got 45 minutes of great hunting. But what else you have is, all right, the hot thermals of the day that were going consistently uphill, now the ground is cooling. And so now you've got some air that's heavier because of the ground starting to cool, and you got the same thing going on at that time of day, but it's just a 180 from what it was doing in the morning when yep. it couldn't make up its mind. So it's called yeah, it's, diurnal, diurnal thermals. It means it changes twice a day and well, see, changes you direction. need an engineer to come up with that kind of term. <laughs> right? Those 50 cent words like that, us accountants, we, we aren't <laughs> handy at that stuff. But diurnal, diurnal thermals. Huh. Well, yep. I die whatever. They, they, <laughs> they Live make, and die by the diurnal yeah, thermals. They, they yeah. make me mad. But I've now, over time, I've learned that sometimes it's best to just be patient and wait it out until that thermal has become predictable and consistent. Yeah. 
And then you add that, the fact that, yeah, on, on this continent, most of our winds are west or northwest or southwest is the prevailings, but the prevailings a lot of times are overruled by the thermals yep. of the day. It's just Yeah, prevailing wind is the, the higher wind direction. So if you get the wind blowing through the trees, that's your prevailing wind. But your yeah. thermals are pretty much up and down unless you get cloud cover during the middle of the day. So you've got the ground getting really warm throughout the day, the sun shining on it, and all of a sudden the clouds come and block the sun, that whole landscape is changing temperature. And yeah. that change in temperature in different areas competing with each other causes the swirling winds. This sometimes will cause, you know, sideways wind. But for the most part, it's either uphill or downhill for those thermals. Yeah. So as far as, I mean, with rifle hunting, the, the world of wind is more about, is it going to affect my shot, stuff like that. With archery hunting... The world of wind is all it's about, everything. setup is all about wind. Yeah, I mean, your approach, your setup, yeah, yeah everything. Is it, is it safe to say in your experience that an elk is going to come in either perpendicular to the wind or is going to loop and try to get downwind of you? I, I think, it, it, yeah, I think it's safe to say that the majority of the time it is. And I think even stepping back into elk behavior a little bit, everything an elk does is based on the thermals. Yeah. And that's where they feed, where they water, where they bed, the travel routes they use, they are never leaving themselves unprotected. Yeah. And so in the heat of the battle in the rut, you know, you're calling this elk in, he is a wild animal and he does not forget his instincts for the most part. Every yeah. once in a while you'll find that bull that's just, he hears <laughs> that lonely cow and he's like, forget it, I am going in. And he mm. comes trotting in, you know, with the wind at his back and there's, right. you know, we've got perfect wind. But for the most part, they are, if they can't get into that setup with the wind in their favor, they will try to take a route that allows them to get a vantage point visually or some other way. But for the most part, when an elk comes in, He's trying to use his nose to make sure there's no danger. It's not that he's coming in suspecting that calling's kind of questionable. Is that a human? Maybe there might be some danger there. It's just his natural instinct to protect himself anywhere he travels, including coming into a setup. Yeah. Well, the thing that I think as humans we fail to understand is an elk doesn't have to be home for dinner at six o'clock. Yeah. He doesn't have to be to work tomorrow morning. He's got one job. I got to stay alive. Yep. I got to make it till dark. And then when I get up tomorrow morning, <laughs> I got to make it till dark again. Yep. That's his job. He, uh, <laughs> and he's got to make it from dark until light, which is might be but, the hardest time for, a, for an elk to stay alive. It, it might be. And, and so I think we as humans have a tendency to think that the wild world is on our calendars yeah. and our busy schedules. No. They, <laughs> they, don't they have really, one mission. Yeah. Stay alive. Yeah. And so if that, I mean, I, you think about how many times you've called in a bull and he just stands there and looks. He doesn't do anything. They'll stand there for 20 minutes, motionless, just looking. Yep. And you're like, isn't he getting bored? Is it, <laughs> hasn't he figured this out yet? No. Oh. Hey, what, what, what's his hurry? He's, uh, he's got nothing All to do. the elk with ADD and impatience get shot the yeah. first day of season. And <laughs> you know, it's only the smart ones that are yeah. patient that yeah. live. Yeah, if they don't have that keen awareness, that genetic trait gets removed from the gene pool at an early age. Which is another reason why I like to hunt early in the season, because those dumb elk are still <laughs> there and I have a chance. You know, I've never thought about that one, Corey. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good one. I, I'm going to have to start hunting earlier in the season you know, now. Those young bulls that just haven't... <clears throat> Learned their lesson about the importance of thermals yet become easy targets. Kind of like those, uh, the reason I like to hunt grouse in early September is because the young of the year will sit there right on a stump when yep. like, you get within 10 yards. Yep. Or is that old? And still let you get three shots at them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, yeah. Usually within three, I'm okay. Four. <laughs> I, I carry one grouse arrow, my, my judo tip. But I've burned a quiver full of broadheads. I was going to say, you carry one elk arrow that specifically, I've got to save this in case we see an elk. The rest of them are fair game for grouse. <laughs> yeah, Corey looks at my broadheads. I'm spinning them there, and there's nicks and gouges <laughs> and bends to them. I'm like, yeah, that, that'll work for a grouse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm just trying to think of all of the different places where wind is just, I mean, where I'm going to find elk is very wind dependent. I, I, if there are certain places where I, I think that 
the wind's going to be coming over the crest of a ridge or a knoll. My experience is because there's this uh, kind of like eddy effect that yeah. comes over. They have it. You got a tech turbulence. Well, no, there, there's even one, there's one more technical than that. I Some guy was laying it on me at a show one day. I can't remember what it is, but anyhow, we'll call it turbulence <laughs> where it comes over and it drops and then it almost gotcha. does like a, a turbulence uh, <laughs> whirlpool, whatever you want to call it, eddy <laughs> effect. And I, I think most of the times when I watch where do those elk bed on a ridge, they're bedded somewhere a fourth to a third down from the crest yep. of the ridge. Not always, but very often. And then they're looking downhill yep. and they're all positioned in different directions. And But the one thing they all have is they're playing that win that even though you think, oh, I'm good, yeah. all of a sudden. And they know they're not good. The, you're not good coming from that direction. And so that's right. why they bed there. Yeah, They're protected 180 degrees from the thermals. And as long as they can protect their other 180 degrees with their ears or their eyes, yeah. they're pretty much safe. Yeah. And when I'm, uh, that gets back to an efficiency of how I use my time is on a day when I know what the wind's doing and it's consistent and I'm glassing because in rifle season, it's a glassing game for me to be the most effective. I'm glassing the top half of the ridge. Yep. Uh, even if it's a, a little a step off a main ridge, whatever. I'm usually not glassing way down in the bottom when I know that they're bedded. I know if they're going to bed, they're going to use that wind to their advantage, and that's probably going to be somewhere in the top half, probably more likely the top third of that ridge to take advantage of, hey, if anyone walks the crest of this ridge, I'm going to smell them. I'm going to sneak out of here. Well, they're, the other thing is think about what the thermals are doing during that middle of the day when they're bedded down. Thermals are coming uphill. Yeah. If they're down at the bottom, they lose most of their advantage for any danger coming in below them because the bottom 100 yards of a, of a drainage is a small right. geographic area. If they can get to the top of that drainage up on the top of the hill, any thermals in that drainage are going to be coming up to them. So they can smell danger you know, it might be a half mile down drainage, but those thermals are coming up and spreading out upward as they come up. So during the middle of the day, you're probably going to find elk closer to the top of the mountain than the bottom. And uh. conversely, in the mornings when they're feeding during the night, when they're bedding, not in their bedding area, but in their nighttime area, it's usually going to be at those lower elevations because all of the thermals from surrounding areas are coming down to that lower spot. Yeah, I, I'm just... I should have made notes of all the, and the reason I'm bringing all these up is because what's rolling through my head are the times I've made stupid <laughs> mistakes and screwed up and spooked some away because of that. See, and I, I like to use the examples of other people making mistakes instead well, of myself. Where do you want me to start? I got a long <laughs> list of them, of course. I, I usually just use other people as the excuse for why I didn't get an elk. You know, I was mm -hmm. calling in this big bull, and I had the wind perfect, and all of a sudden here came somebody from just on the other oh, side yeah. with the wind going right to him, and they messed it up. Yeah, it, it's always someone else's fault. Totally. That, that is the beauty of hunting with camera guys. <laughs> is, uh, in our operation, it's always the camera guy's fault, yep. first and foremost. I don't care what happens even if he was sleeping in the tent yeah it's his fault that we got a flat tire. i mean camera guys are on the same level as obamacare and wolves and yeah all that yeah, yeah. So anything you, oh, that can yeah, mess up a hunt that's right we went through this with you the two times you were on elk hunts with us that yep. i told you blame lauren or blame marcus uh, that's fine yep. it doesn't matter and then uh, since we were hunting in wolf country if they weren't around you you could blame it on wolves and yep. that's fine and if none of those could be blamed, then it was uh, my uncle's catch-all as Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> I like tongue, it. Tongue in cheek there, but yeah. Uh, so, but uh, I don't know how many more wind examples the world wants to hear from us. I'm sure we'll think yeah. of some more as we talk about some of these other things. But I, for me, uh, scouting and hunting is eliminating where they ain't. Yep. To figure out where they are. Yeah. And wind is a big part of, I, I'm like, no, an elk's not going to bed there. He's not going to have the, the wind in his favor. So just don't even worry about that yeah. spot. Yeah, he might, if someone bumps him, he might come screaming across there, but that's not the setup you I want. You get a shot, yeah. Right. So I, yeah, there's lots of places to screw it up there with are. the wind. And elk know that. And their, their sense of smell is so acute. We just can't even fathom how well they can smell. And people talk about... <laughs> 
cover scents and scent killers and all these different things, it really doesn't matter. No. Because if you have a molecule of your scent coming off your body and the wind's going to that elk, right, he done. might get a nose full of 99 molecules of cow and heat scent, but if he gets one molecule of human scent, Gone. he knows there's danger. Right. And he is instantly on guard and, and knows that. And so I don't, I don't even play around or mess around with that. Wind is everything. Getting the wind in my favor all my setups, the way I approach the elk, everything is focused on the wind. Yeah. Well, I get so many comments about, I'm sorry, we got a buzzing and popping here. I must have did something to my my wire. But I get a lot of comments where people ask me, do you use scent control products? Do you wear any of the scent, whatever, clothing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because... Maybe that's an effective way uh, when you're tree stand hunting or blind hunting. I'm very seldom tree stand or blind. I'm, yeah. I never tree stand hunt. Sometimes I'll sit over water. Or I'll sit on a corner of a trail where I think, oh, they're going to come in this way. Uh, but I wonder, and, and I don't have anything to support this, but I just in my mind when I get that question so often, I wonder if there are some people who have success using those products in the whitetail world if they think that you can cheat the elk world and cheat may not be the right word but that somehow because you're wearing that or because you did whatever with your spray down stuff that somehow uh, i can kind of cut a few corners here yeah. in the elk world my experience is elk hunting you're so active you're you're moving so much you're going to be sweated yeah you got uh, just you know whether it's your your scalp your hair your breath your whatever they're going to smell something like but they you recognize said. the danger right yeah and so i i don't know maybe and i think if anything maybe it buys you a degree of advantage maybe instead of your scent cone leaving your body and coming out and fanning at a 90 degree angle if you're doing everything you can to reduce that it's coming out at a 60 degree angle Okay. And so that gets that bull 10 yards farther into your shooting lane before he smells you. Okay. But I just, I, we were hunting Arizona uh, the second time in 2008, and we were walking up this hillside, and it was morning, thermals were coming down, and we got a whiff of something dead, something rotten. And it was overpowering to the point that I couldn't even begin to smell anything else. You know, wow. if I had, I don't know smelling sniffing salts in front of me i wouldn't be it wouldn't have an effect because that overwhelming just stench of a of a rotting carcass so we followed it up there and it was a cow a, a domestic cow oh okay and it had died there and it was rotten and bloated and just stunk like crazy and we started talking with our sense of smell where it is to smell that strongly imagine what that smell smells like to elk and we started thinking just us walking through the woods is probably that offensive to an elk that they smell so well with millions of scent receptacles in their nose. We probably smell up the woods like that. And it only takes us walking through once and every elk in the drainage that's either up or downwind of us knows there's a human there and vacates the area. Yeah. Well, I, I'll try to cheat, shortcut it with movement a little bit, not much if I think they're looking at me. Sound, I'm pretty liberal with yeah. sound. I don't, I don't worry about that that much. We were in Unit 8 in Arizona, and my buddy Lee Havemeyer from Minnesota, he'd never shot an elk before, and he spotted two that came and bedded. And I said, we got to get there. We got to get you set up for a shot. And he comes from the whitetail world where if you're making a lot of noise, you're going to hear kind of a snort. <laughs> and see a white flag going. And we're running across this boulder field through the pinions, and he's looking at me like, what are you doing trying to <laughs> scare them off? Yeah. <laughs> we get there, and they're bedded 100 yards below us. And after the hunt, he's like, I would have had no idea that an elk would sit tight like that with that amount of noise. Yeah. I'm like, well, noise, yes. Scent, no. Wind. And I think it's important on that. You know, I know it's not what we're talking about, but with elk senses, Sound is one thing, noise is another thing. Right. And sound, you know, natural sounds, breaking sticks, rolling rocks, things like that. Yeah, you can get away with a lot. You start yeah. making unnatural sounds, human voices, uh, right. a plastic bugle tube yeah. banging off of a tree or a limb or something. They right. recognize that isn't natural and that's that's bad. So. Yeah, they, they recognize Velcro also. <laughs> Uh, they just just saying, you know. Saying Isn't that for, like a, a brand marketing yeah. thing? The whole world recognizes Velcro. Yeah, or yeah. It's just saying for a friend. 
<laughs> Speaking of unnatural noises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoever designed that backpack in 2001, I think it was like, really? <laughs> oh, well. But now I, I'm just trying to think of what other wind problems come to mind. It's interesting that I put it as number three on mine. And I think that's because I do more rifle hunting yep. and you do more archery hunting. And you put it as number one. Uh, would it be number just, one, number two, number three, number four, and number five? It probably would. If there's one thing, especially for a newer elk hunter or someone um, who hasn't tasted a lot of success, I think that would be the number one thing I would recommend them to work on. It's not using your calls. It's not physical conditioning. I mean, all those things are important, but if you're going out there and are a great caller or you're in great shape or can shoot your bow really well, you aren't going to get a chance to do any of that effectively if you aren't paying attention to the wind. So I'd put it at the top of the list for the number one thing to always remember. And I've been elk hunting now for, I don't know, 30 some years. Wow. And I still, it's number one on my list every day I'm elk hunting. It's the number one thing I'm paying attention to. Yeah. How many puffer bottles you go through in a year? <laughs> if you use them right, you can get through with just one. Okay. The problem is most people turn them upside down and squeeze the actual powder out. Me? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. my buddy, David Burdett, we talked about yeah. him last episode. He used to carry a plastic mustard bottle, a yellow mustard bottle. Wow. Big and one, he would huh? fill it up with, I don't know, cornstarch or something. And you could trail him through the woods by this white powder that was all over the huckleberry brush. Literally, you could see where he had been. He would just go along and just squirt half of a can of that talcum powder or cornstarch, whatever he put in there, and it was physically evident. You know, if you just take it and shake it up a little bit, it makes a little dust, and you just puff the little dust air out of it, huh. you can see which way the wind's going, and you save all the powder in there. Do you, do you have your own brand of puffer bottle i don't why don't you so i actually bought a 20 pound box from canada several years ago probably 15 years ago of the the material that they use for the puffer bottles yeah and i filled probably i don't know actually my hunting partner donnie filled most of them but we uh -huh. built a, an actual little press to fill these bottles with measured amounts of it and filled hundreds of them <laughs> and I used them as giveaways at seminars. I think I'm down to about 15 of them left. And so now they're stashed away for the rest of my life. So I have one for each season. And well, I think you have a business opportunity there. Ah, that's, I'm, uh, I mean, imagine if somebody had the wind checker recommended and designed by Corey Jacobson. So the one they should use is the one by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. It, that was a shameless plug of a sponsor, wasn't it? No, <laughs> I didn't. They, they do make a, a little bottle. In fact, I used, didn't know they made one. Yeah. It's called Wind Checker. Well, there we go. Yeah. So you check the wind with it. Why didn't I but know that? Commercially, they and it's the same powder I bought way back when. Yeah. And again, you don't use the actual powder. You use the smoke that comes off of the dust as you shake it up. And right. So go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com, buy yep. your wind checker and your calls and use promo code Elk Talk and yep. save 15%. Yep. There we go. That's a, I mean, if they save no 15%, I mean, I'm the accountant type. I look at that and, well, well, that's like you can get seven of them for the price of six. And then that you'd was have a fast lifetime math. supply. That was fast math. Even I, for I, an I was doing that math. I, I'm over here. Okay, I was, was going to say that. Down. You didn't even do, look at your computer. I can do long division. Really? Yeah. How long does it take? Long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, those are those are a lot of just I guess brief touches. Yeah. On a really Deep. in depth. Yeah. Really, we, we got kind of windy there as we were. We talking could get about. a lot windier yeah. if we really wanted to dive in and talk about thermals. But <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll I'm, save a topic for the end and and use it as our question of the week. Okay. I'm I'm good with whatever. So I I I just say that thermals is, is something that no one needs to be embarrassed or, or bashful about not having a life experience yeah. exposed to them. I didn't. And boy, I made a lot of mistakes, screwed up a lot of really good opportunities and was just dumbfounded until I started asking guys who grew up in the West, reading more about it, researching it. All right. The physics of it makes complete sense. Yeah. I mean, something warm is lighter. It rises. Something cold is denser. It 
Get them. Yeah. Get them sink. Look at your house. The heat. Heat vents yeah. are on the floor for a reason. Right. Because <laughs> heat rises. They come out the floor. As it rises, it fills the room. If you put all your heat vents on the ceiling, it's not uh, going to be as effective. It. Yeah. You won't have any snow accumulating on your roof, but. Yeah. Hot air rises. <laughs> Just remember that. Warm air rises when you're out in the mountains. Uh, During the middle of the day, thermals are going up. All right. So we took care of your number one and my number three. I'm going to cross those off. Ooh. So. You got a list. I better look we're, at my list. We're halfway, th- halfway through this podcast, and we've only got one of the five. Man, we're going to drag this one out, aren't we? We're, we're going to tease them with... Oh, man. We're milking <laughs> we, it. We better get through some of these a little bit faster. All right. So we did your number one. Okay. We'll do my number one. Yeah. And then we'll go to yours. My number one was, and this is, again, personal experience, but I see it a lot in uh, people who ask me a lot of questions, is lack of understanding of elk, their needs, and their behaviors. Why do elk do what they do? Why, that why kind of answers where you're going to find them. Because for me, and I open every seminar I do with, you can't kill what you can't find. Yep. I may have misquoted you, but I, I wrote something not too long ago and, and used something similar to that, that Randy Newberg said, you can't kill elk that aren't there, or you right. can't kill elk if you can't find them. And, right. To yeah. kill an elk, you got to find an elk. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, and I know that sounds really basic, but, and people have heard me say it so many times. And in fact, I start, I have the, the manuscript and outline of a book on this, but I'm just, way behind. I think the publisher gave up on me. <laughs> I, and they heard me talking about the five calendar periods of elk hunting. And that is really how I came up with that was by trying to understand more about elk. And I always say, oh, okay, we've got the early season, which to me is August. Then we've got pre-rut, which is usually September 1st to the 10th or 12th. It's it, peak of the rut's not quite there. Yep. Then that transitions to the peak rut, which is September 10th, 12th-ish to maybe October 5th-ish, somewhere in there. Then you got this phase where it's transitioning to the post rut, which is, I'd say post rut, for me, depending on where I'm at, for mature bulls starts October 10th to the 15th and goes to the end of October. And for me, anything November or December is late season. Yep. And a lot of people ask me, well, why, why do you look at it that way? Well, all of the reading I've done on elk, and I've done a ton of it because of how little I knew. Now I've become like this consumer of elk <laughs> biology, <laughs> elk, anything. Uh, my, my library of books at home is full of elk ecology, elk science, elk whatever. Uh, And I don't know it all, but it's all helped me become a better elk hunter because now I know what their need is in any of those five periods. And there's four primary needs for elk is what I've broken it down to. Yeah, they got more needs, but I say it's food, it's water, it's security or sanctuary, and seasonally at parts of of our hunting periods is breeding. Yeah, there's some other needs, but those are the ones that I know I can use to determine where elk are going to be because it all comes back to finding an elk so I can try to hang my tag on an elk. And I think a lot of people don't go through that exercise. They don't invest in themselves or in their elk knowledge so that, all right, yeah, I had this tag. I, I drew this tag for early September and I went in there and man, there were elk everywhere. Four years later, I drew the late rifle tag the last week of October and man, I don't know. Wolves Nothing must have them all. <laughs> they disappeared. Yeah. Well, guess what? They have a different need in late October than they do in early September. And so if they aren't there, that need's not there. Exactly. Yeah. So they're somewhere else trying to fill that need in October that is higher up their list than that same need was in September. And, and for me, I'll just, you know, talk, because you wrote an entire module for the University of Elk Hunting online course for me on that exact topic, on post and late season, but going through the five seasons. And for me, I knew there were changes. You know, I'm a visual person. If you draw something on a grease board, I can understand it. If you tell me in words, sometimes it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. I can't necessarily on my own comprehend what's going on. I can see a, a piece of paper and I can tell that the colors change five times there, but I'm not putting the pieces together that they're changing because the elk are changing needs, locations are changing for those needs and all that. 
And so for me, just reading through what you created in that module, you know, my focus has always been archery. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what I grew up doing. That's what I love to do. And so I have a really good grasp of what happens in September for the rut. Right. But after that, I had no clue. And just simply reading through what you said and talking about needs, I, can, I know where to find those needs. Yeah. And understanding, you know, the elk have left this area because of those needs. I mean, I, I think my elk knowledge doubled overnight just reading that one or two chapters in that module because of the way you understand it and explain it. Well, that's very generous. I, I know how much your elk knowledge is. It's not going to double overnight, but thank you for saying that. Uh, but I, I would say the biggest, the most drastic change in their needs, their, their needs are pretty similar in pre-rut and peak rut. There, there's kind of almost a blending. There's not a real fine change there. But once you get to post-rut, and there's a reason why most states host their rifle hunting seasons in the post rut is because that is the hardest time to kill an elk. Yep. Though, though at least uh, a mature bull on public land, he's like, you know what? I know what this means. I'm <laughs> smelling all this. I'm hearing these guys running generators down at that camp. I am heading out. Yep. And I remember this spot from last year, man. We hung out there for six weeks and no one ever bothered us. Well, guess what? He's going right back to that same, same place. Spot. And so I, I think the change from peak rut to post rut is the most dramatic change of what elk do and where they go to find their needs and satisfy their needs. Yep. There's not nearly as much change between the, the post rut and the late season, kind of like there, there's not a lot of change between pre-rut and peak rut. Yep. Um, to me, I, I hunt post-rut and late season very similar because they're both focused on what I call sanctuary mode. The beauty of late season is usually by now they're bachelored up. You're seeing two, three, four, maybe six bulls in a group. Yep. Whereas you got old eyes like mine, I can my chances of spotting them if they're six is way better <laughs> than if there's just one of them. And when they leave those cows, it's not like they instantly bachelor up. Yeah. They got a, like 10, 15 days there where they're kind of loners. And it's almost and, a, a reverse of what happens in the early season to the pre-rut. You know, they're bachelored up and yeah. then they split off single. Then yeah. they go to the cows. Then they split off single. Then they go back to their bachelor groups. And yeah. each of those phases and those transitions are based on a need. You yeah. know, they're leaving their summer grounds where the need was feed. In the summer, in the early, you know, before the the um, before the pre rut really kicks in in that early season, but the reason the pre rut's kicking in is because their need is changing. There's a reason that's a different season. Yeah, and their need is changing to breeding. Right, and, and they go there, and then breeding is the focus. And then when breeding's no longer, the need changes. We have a new season. Yep, and that that's what I I. I'm like you, I'm very visual. So I had to break this down. And this, I really hijacked this. I think I told you from my walleye fishing. <laughs> it's like, how can I be so good at finding walleyes at any time of year? Well, I grew up. I mean, I lived on a river. I knew what walleyes did any time of the year. Yeah. And I didn't fish the same hole at the same depth at the same lure <laughs> all year long. No, I knew that, okay, they're going to be shallow in May because they're spawning or April. All right. I know that come late August, they're going to be out deep because they're looking for the cooler water and I need a different presentation because they're satisfying a different need. And it was after six years of failure that I went and bought Jack Ward Thomas's book. I think it's Elk and Elk Ecology is what it is. And I read that and I read and I read and I read. And this was before, I, I think I had a, I might have had a dial up modem for my Gateway 2000 computer at that time. <laughs> so I wasn't, the online research still hadn't hit its stride yet. So it was mostly sitting downstairs reading by a lamplight. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I kind of used what I, what had brought me success in fishing. Like I could always find these walleyes. How, how, how was it that I could find them so consistently? Well, I knew a lot about them. Yeah. I, I quickly realized, well, I don't really know crap about elk. I mean, something so simple is, all right, in the seasons when they needed, when food was their top priority, I didn't even know what they ate. I thought they, <laughs> I thought they browsed on bitter brush like 
mule deer do? No, they eat grasses and forbs, okay? Or, or I better go look for grasses and forbs and I better quit looking in this. The, the other thing was I, I had this idea that, you know, you think of the West and these big vistas of vast expanses of dark timber. Yeah. Like, ooh, that's beautiful. Bet you there's a lot of elk in there. Starved out elk, yeah, maybe. Not unless there's an open hillside somewhere <laughs> they can go and get some grass. Yeah, so it was those kind of basic pieces of knowledge that I didn't understand. So even if I would have known that the need, primary need was food, I didn't know enough about what their food source was. Yep. I I went to Nevada. When I told you in the last podcast I had that 2005 Nevada elk tag. Well, I'm looking for grasses. Well, guess what? There aren't a lot of grasses in Nevada. There are a lot of sagebrush. Yep. A lot of bitter brush and buck brush and a lot of pinion juniper. They'll eat those darn juniper berries. Yep. Have you ever seen them do that? I've never seen them eat them, but I've seen where they've been through and all of them are eating off of the yeah. head high junipers. Yeah. And I, I had no idea. I get talking to the biologist. I'm like, what are they eating around here? Oh, they're eating they're, this time of year. They're on those juniper berries. Yep. Oh. And it's what? amazing how their feed source changes throughout the year. So their need mm -hmm. is still feed, right? but that food source changes based on where they are, based on the weather and the climate. And yeah. We yeah. have elk right in our backyard during the winter now where we live. And it was interesting this year. We had a group of bulls and several cows that stayed right there in our yard. Like literally we could look out the bonus room window and see four bulls just laying right there. Hmm. But it was neat to be able to see you know, they were eating bark off of ponderosa pine, small little saplings. And, wow. you know, not as a main food source, but they were eating it. And you go out there and you see the teeth marks. And then the willows and things that they were actually eating the tops off of, the tender tops in the winter, that's not something they eat in the spring and summer. Right. And so just knowing those food sources, and then I started recognizing it, shed hunting and stuff. I'm looking for these things that they're going to be eating during the winter to try to figure out where were the bulls during March, April, and they're shedding their antlers and before the green grasses start coming up. And so, yeah, it's, it's not just hunting season, but understanding elk behavior from start to finish is so important. Yeah. And so what, that, what was the book again? Uh, I think it's elk, It's by Jack Ward Thomas. I think it's Elk and Elk Ecology. Is what it's someone I, I've, I don't know how many times I've told people, go get that book. And yeah. someone wrote me the other day and said, hey, it's out of print. I was just, <laughs> you just can get say one on Amazon for like $400 is, or well, something. I was going to say, everybody's on Amazon right now trying to order that book. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this person said it was out of print, but he'd found one on Amazon. And he emailed me and said, is it really worth, I can't remember the dollar amount. Maybe he said $90 <laughs> or something. I'm like, I don't know. Well, I loaned mine out to a guy. Didn't get it's, it back. Uh, it's not, I don't have it back. It's like, what the heck? No. I mean, uh, to steal a guy's elk hunting book, that's like... That's almost like as bad as taking his elk hunting spot. I, that, that's pretty That's cool. a whole other podcast. Baby. Yeah, that'll be a completely different podcast. So this whole understanding of elk and these needs of food, water, sanctuary, and breeding, the whole food aspect is what drove me to Burns. And people... I. I I, in fact, on X and I are doing a 10 video series that's going to be out. Well, it'll be out by the time this podcast is out about cyber scouting, e-scouting, whatever you want to call it. And we're doing a whole video on burns because people are like, Newberg, is there anything you don't hunt in burns? I've seen you hunt antelope and whitetails and mule deer and elk. Uh, <laughs> No, I think I'll hunt anything in a burn. I, I've shot sharp tail in a burn. <laughs> and, uh, but the reason I got there is I started trying to learn more about elk food. And if you've got large canopies that are not disrupted, if you can find where the fire has disrupted that canopy, there are going to be elk there. Yep. Because what they need for food, even if in this later sanctuary mode when food is lower down their priority it's number two to surviving and staying alive they will find little burned areas next to rocky canyons and craggy areas ugly yep. spots where they only have to travel a couple hundred yards to go from sanctuary to food i was going to say that's important if you have that canopy for shelter for them mm -hmm. right next to a burn they can get up and walk 200 yards yeah. and as long as the thermals protect them and everything they've got food they've got sanctuary they're protected by their senses there's probably water close by and if there's not They'll travel 10 miles to go to water and come back to bed right there. <laughs> they will. It's crazy. Uh, so anyhow, that, that's why my number one lack of understanding of elk, that was 
Randy Newberg as an, uh, a novice beginning greenhorn elk hunter. I had not grown up around elk. I hadn't had, you know, family members or fellow hunters or mentors in my community who could, I think through osmosis, people who grow up in elk country don't realize how much of a benefit it is. They don't realize the education they are receiving without right. even yeah. recognizing Just it. going out camping yep. in the summer or going fishing or going shed antler hunting or whatever. All of these little pieces are building that young person's elk hunting knowledge yep. so that by the time they get elk hunting age, they got such a head start on uh, uh, tin horns like me. <laughs> and so that's why I put it as my number one, because until I decided to make that investment in myself and try to catch up to speed, I think I'd still be struggling to kill elk if I hadn't done that. Yep. So. And we did a survey on elk101.com several years ago, and it included, I think there were, I, don't quote me on it, but there were several thousand, five or 6,000 people who partook of the, the survey and we asked what the number one thing for successful elk hunters, we broke them into three categories, those who had never hunted, those who had hunted but never killed, or four categories, those who had hunted and killed but not consistent, and then those who were consistently successful. Mm -hmm. And for consistently successful elk hunters, the number one thing that contributed to their success was elk hunting knowledge, yeah. which is exactly what we're talking about. Just those things, understanding elk, elk behavior, elk needs, yeah. their habits and habitat and all that. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to get to number twos here. Your, your number two. I'm, I'm going to be interested to see this because we said aggressive versus passive. And I've, I've, I don't know how many days we've hunted together, but I've never seen you be passive. So. Really? Huh? And, unless <laughs> slowing down to shoot a grouse can, is considered passive. Well, you've never seen me be passive in that respect. That's I, if I, I'm passive, I'm usually coming back to grab you to go to the bugling elk because you're mm -hmm. sidetracked by the grouse. Uh, that's true. I do remember though on the one hunt in Montana where we were sitting down eating Snickers bars, admiring the view of the lake, and. That was kind of passive, but we got up and you did a cow call, and here came a bull <laughs> running around the corner. I'm like, man. Well, we do have to sleep at some point, so. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think maybe what I should have put as 1A on mine is a mid-morning nap. Or a yeah, mid afternoon. I mean, it has to be wealthy. Yeah, I was going to say mid morning is, is usually yeah. prime okay. time to be okay. sitting on the elk for a midday hunt. Okay. So I, somewhere in there, I need about an hour nap. Yeah. I mean, like serious snoring, cutting logs, sort of. And you do. Yeah, <laughs> getting after it, man. I a mean, couple times, I think Lauren was with us on that hunt, and mm -hmm. you were out. Oh. And there was, I mean, it was grizzly bear snoring. We're in grizzly country, and we were right. both looking at each other a little nervous, like, Thinking I was calling is this a mating in? call or anything? <laughs> or do we have to be worried about a grizzly coming in? Uh, well, I can sleep on demand. I mean, yeah. I, I have no problem sleeping, so I, I think that should have been my 1A. But anyhow, number, aggressive. Two, number two on your list is aggressive, and I said versus passive, and I think you'd kind of called it, you know, how aggressive to be or yeah. being aggressive enough or whatever. What, how, do, just, how do you come at that? So I think for me, I, I'm an aggressive hunter, and that's not necessarily my personality, but that's my hunting personality for elk. And if I'm hunting, I don't know, say something that doesn't allow me to call to them, and I, I hate hunting animals I can't call. There's mm -hmm. just, the, for me, we, <laughs> I was hunting bear with my kids a couple weeks ago. Mm. It's like, I wish I could just make a bear call and get an answer so I'd know if there was a bear here. And if there's not, I'd move on. Yeah. Because it just seems almost like luck and happenstance to just wander around without being able to call. But my calling style is aggressive. And everything about hunting elk, I take to an aggressive level. And it's important to, to note that that's not a reckless aggression. Uh -huh. It's very measured but I push the envelope. I, I make things happen. I think I try to make things happen. I try to create opportunities. Whereas I think a lot of times the mistakes, especially new hunters make, is they're not confident right. in, in a lot of the aspects of it. And mm -hmm. so whether that's aggressively pushing themselves physically to go into another drainage, whether it's you know aggressively calling, aggressively, um, whatever the aspect is, they're too timid. And they end up not having opportunities. And I think sometimes you have to push out of your comfort zone and push yourself out there to create that opportunity. And so for me, 
Uh, when I wrote that on there, I think that it's important to understand when to be aggressive and mm -hmm. when to be more passive. And that's just a case by case. Every elk is going to be different. There, you know, we talked in the last podcast, if the walleye aren't biting, even if they're there and you can see them on the fish finder, you move on. Right. And a lot of times if I'm looking to call in an elk, if there's an elk bugling and he's just not interested, I'll move on. But at the same time, there might be an opportunity there to slip in very timidly and get him riled up and make something happen. That's not the time to just go in there full bore aggressive. If he's not interested at all, you're going to push him away. So understanding when to be aggressive and when to, to back off a little is important. But with that being said, I think for the most part, elk hunters in general aren't aggressive enough. Hmm. And a lot of times, you know, they get an elk to bugle and instead of moving in from 300 yards to 120 yards, they sit there at 300 yards and do the customary one bugle every 60 seconds. The bull bugles, they wait 60 seconds, they answer. The bull waits three minutes, he bugles, they wait 60 seconds, they answer. You know, just that <laughs> textbook, timid, hope the bull comes in. Yeah. And for me, I'm instantly analyzing, okay, what mood is he in? Is he moving? Is he with cows? Uh, what can I do to trigger the response in that bull? And it usually means getting aggressive, whether that's aggressive to make him want to fight, whether that's aggressive moving in really quickly and getting just pushing right into his grill, into his, his uh, comfort zone. Um, but I, I think, and people have hunted, we had a camera guy hunt with us a couple of years ago in Wyoming, and he had been to several seminars where I talk about being aggressive, and he said, I had no idea the level of aggression and how hard you push each of these situations. Hmm. And he said, it's a, he went home and I think three days later killed an elk. And he uh. said, I just did what you guys were doing <laughs> and it works. And so again, this isn't, you know, for me in the style of hunting, the run and gun, the bugle, the rut action type hunting, I think it's okay to push that envelope a little more. And I think too many hunters just kind of sit back and hope uh, an opportunity or an encounter will come to them. And you think that comes from lack of confidence just because they haven't had experiences that reinforce, hey, yeah. being aggressive is okay. Yeah. Or maybe they come from a background, you know, whitetail hunting. Yeah. You don't want to be aggressive as a whitetail hunter. Right. You're going to, the whitetail are going to hear you or see you and they're going to blow out and you have to hunt differently for whitetail than you do for elk. Yeah. And so I think where a lot of people come from those different backgrounds, um, Maybe it's because I'm borderline ADD. I mean, I just, I can't sit still. And when I hear an elk bugle, <laughs> it's like, I'll spin in circles waiting for somebody to, to get their backpack on their back because I want to go. Well, I've seen you when an elk bugles. And uh, it's kind of like when you're really good Griffon or Dratar <laughs> smells birds. <laughs> Like, all of a sudden, the tail is like, oh, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go, come on. It's like, hold on, man. I, I, uh, I got to get my boots back on. Well, something like that, yeah. I mean, when Corey says it's time to go, you don't want to be slow. Yeah. Because you're already, already going to struggle to keep up. So. Never trust an old man in a hurry. That's uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and make an exception for elk hunting. There you go. Well, I, I I think in one of the future podcasts, we really ought to talk more about all the different versions of aggressive, aggressive in calling, aggressive in yeah. your approach. Uh, for me, and this gets into my, uh, I think a lot of people have a lack of a plan is yeah. my number two. Uh, that also gets into at what point in, let's say there's a five day hunt, how aggressive are you the first day versus the fourth day? Uh, so to me, hunting aggressively and smartly has so many aspects yeah. to it. I think we could do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, I think it's important to stress when I say aggressive, it's not reckless. And I know I yeah. mentioned that, but it's not like he's aggressive. He's got an arrow on the end of his, you know, on his bow and he's got his string in his teeth and he's running through <laughs> the woods with a knife in one hand saying, I'm going to kill this elk. It's not, it's not like that. It's just, I push just a little bit farther than I'm comfortable. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's always good in a lot of things is get yourself out of your comfort zone because that's probably where you learn. Yep. Um, and if you make a mistake, oh, well, you've, you've tried something different, which is probably going to benefit you yeah. going forward. You know, you got to back off a little bit more the next time. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, when I say lack of a plan, and this gets back to assuming, all right, you got five days to go. 
you show up and you say, well, opening morning, I'm going to go sit this metal. And that's really your plan. Yeah. It's a plan built mostly around luck and maybe happenstance. When I show up, usually these are places I've never been to. Uh, like my New Mexico elk tag, I've never hunted elk there before. Um, I got five days, I show up, I better have a plan in place. What am I doing on my scouting days? If I can, I try to show up one or two days early and use those scouting days to help me verify my plan or tweak or alter my Or plan. check off places that you don't want to go back to. There you go. <laughs> I mean, for me, scouting is a process of eliminating yeah. the places where they aren't. Yeah, once you and, find the elk, you're hunting, you're not scouting. Right. Yeah. And so I have, I always, certain spots as morning spots and certain spots as evening spots. I, I don't have, very seldom, I mean, I can't say never, but seldom do I have a spot that I hunt both morning and evening, uh, simply because not many of those spots exist where you're effective based on what the sun is doing, what the glassing light is doing, what the wind is doing, all that stuff. So usually I, I want to also have a morning spot that covers one type of area. I have an evening spot of day one that's going to cover another general type of area. Okay. When you Maybe, say general type of area, you're talking terrain, right, needs. terrain, vegetation, whatever. Okay. Opening morning, I might be glassing. I, I know there's elk feeding down below. I know that as it gets light, these elk are going to be moving up through these saddles, doing some, you know, looking for beds or whatever. So I might find a knob where, okay, I can look at two or three of these travel corridors and that'll be my morning spot. Well, in the evening spot, I know they're not going to get up out of their bed until just before the sun goes down. Yeah. So I'm going to move to a spot where I'm probably closer to a bedding area. So if I do see them, I'm going to have an opportunity to shoot one. So I'm also doing that based on, all right, this spot has water nearby, this spot doesn't. Or I'm, I'm always trying to uh, have one that is, I don't want to say the opposite of, but helps me eliminate some of the, oh, guess what? They're all at a certain elevation because it's so dry, low, I may as well not even look low. What little good vegetation is there, what moisture is there is up high. So I, yeah. I can figure that out within my first one or two days. Right. So I have that plan. Okay, here's what I'm going to do first morning, second morning, and then kind of do my recount of did I see anything? If I saw something, I'm making note of that. I'm, I'm making notes every night. And then the next morning I get up, maybe I've got a morning two spot and I see something there. I was like, oh, okay. I'm seeing elk in these same spots. Uh, I'll have a, an afternoon of day two. I'll have morning of day three and afternoon of day three. After my third day, I sit down and look at my notes. Just almost very analytically and say, all right, what did I see? What didn't I see? What was what I expected? What w wasn't I expecting? Or it might be hunting pressure. It might be, wow, that's what it looked like on the aerial map on OnX. But man, someone came Doesn't in here the and same. Then, yeah, it all <laughs> changed or, you know, whatever. Uh, this road is closed and there's people still driving ATV. So there's, when you get there, you got to have the plan and it, it kind of gets to uh, your number four is with my plan, I got to be flexible and adaptable based on what I'm learning. I usually give myself the first three days of I'm going to work my plan. After the third day, I'm going to do what I said. I'm going to do my, my analytics and then day four and day five. I have to go to school on what I learned in days one, two, or three. And sometimes I still haven't found them. Yeah. So, and if day four, I haven't find them, found them. Day five, I purposely go do something that seems so weird, <laughs> so strange, so stupid. But, you know, the, the definition of stupidity is doing, doing the, the same, same thing, thing many times and expecting a different result. Yeah. Or as my one friend says, if you always do it, you always done, you'll always get what you always got. So true. And, so you uh, mentioned something there. You said, you know, day one morning you'll have a plan, evening you'll have a plan, second day morning. And you'd mentioned that if you see elk at a certain place, you take note of it. Mm -hmm. Are you not hunting the elk? No, like, I, I mean, I will. And, okay. and if I think I have a chance to move in on them, but you know how sometimes you, you find them and you're like, I'm, I'm going to get them this afternoon. And yep. they just, 
It's like they vaporized. Yep. Okay. I'll make note that they were there. And I might go back again and, and say, all right, instead of going to my morning three spot, I'm going back to my morning two spot. I'm going to double up on that one. Yep. And if I don't see them there, it's like, all right, what, what happened? So, yeah, when I see them, I'm trying to hunt them. I'm trying. Uh, so first morning you see elk, you're hunting them. Oh, Are you yeah. going, you know, you have a plan for that evening. Mm-hmm. If you're on the elk, are you going back to that same area? Or are you have if, just if avoiding I'm that and going to? Yeah, if I'm on elk, I mean, there's the old saying in the fishing world, don't leave fish to find yeah. fish. I don't leave elk to find elk. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. perfect world as I show up to scout a day early in the evening before season opens, I find them. That's, I would almost give up my, my last day of hunting for an act for a day of scouting at the beginning, because I can eliminate so much in one day of scouting, just through observation, through, you know, you're hearing this, you're seeing that you're, there's just so many things going on that instantly what you were seeing on the map and what you had in your head is you're driving out to the unit <laughs> and then you get there, you're like, uh oh. Yeah. Cross that spot off. Uh oh. So that day of scouting, I'm really trying hard to find where they are because my best bet uh, in rifle seasons, especially, is find that bull the night before season opens, put them to bed, make sure Be you're comfortable. Yep. Mark your path out on your Onyx system in the dark on the way out or, or even do it in the daylight so you can see the best path, but make sure you're marking that trail. Yep. So the next morning you're going in backtracking on that trail you put on your GPS or on your, your smartphone and you're there before the sun comes up and you're going to kill that bull. Yep. That's the hope. Because but, at that point, the elk are typically in some kind of a pattern. Yep. The need doesn't change overnight, hopefully. Nope. At that point. Nope. And so if you see him at night, he's probably going to be right there. They usually don't travel a whole lot at night. So right. first thing the next morning, yeah. hopefully he's right there. That's that's the perfect world. Yep. Obviously, a lot of times you show up and you still haven't found him when season opens. And so those first couple of days of seasons are a continuation of the scouting. Yep. If scouting is, quote unquote, trying to find him. And I always, you know, my, my best scouting is done with a bugle tube. And I tell people that all the time that, you know, I don't necessarily scout a lot in the summer because so much does change. Mm-hmm. But during season, I am scouting like a madman with my bugle tube. Yeah. Because what I'm looking for is a bugling elk. And yeah. if I can find a bull that's bugling during season, I'm no longer scouting. Right. <laughs> I'm hunting. And I want to go from scouting to hunting as quickly as possible. Right. So that involves covering a lot of country and... Yeah, I and I would it. say that that plan that I'm talking about, or the, well, I said lack of a plan, it gets back to your same thing. I want to be in scouting mode as little as possible. Yep. I only have X window of time. Every listener has whatever time blocked out for a hunt. Yep. You want to be in scouting mode into hunting mode as quickly as yep. possible. And the better your plan, the more research, the more you understand about elk, the less time you're going to have to spend in scouting mode and the more time you're going to be spending in hunting mode. So is your plan, when you're talking about morning one, you've got a spot that you're going to go and glass from. Uh, the evening of, of day one, you've got a different spot that you're going to. Have you, is this all stuff that from e-scouting, you've identified places based on what you feel the needs are and vantage points that you can get in glass from? Yep. So you've got, what, six or seven different spots located yeah. based on different needs and different vantage points. Yep. Because I, I want to, and they're all slightly different. Like one might be a thousand feet in elevation higher than the other. One might have an edge of where aspens transition to sage. One might be a spot where there's a big bunch of dark timber, but there's a burn or an avalanche chute that's disrupted the canopy or whatever it might be. One might be a really small burn in a pocket of pinion juniper ponderosa. Yeah. All, I, I, you look at my map and hardly any of my first five spots look at all similar. <laughs> they, they, they look like, what, what's this guy wanting to see the entire unit in, in two and a half days? Yeah. Kind of. Realistically, yeah. Yeah. Because... Or at least a snapshot of the entire unit. Right. So that's how I do it. I can't say it works perfectly, but what I've found is if I have a plan... I'm more confident. I'm going to stick to that plan. I'm going to work that plan. And sooner or later, it's going to work out. Yep. And I may not kill one, but I'll, I will find them in that five days. Very, it doesn't, I can't say it's 100% foolproof, but 
usually within that five days we'll find them. Yep. So. Well, I think that's, you know, that transitions perfectly into my number four, which was having backup plans. Yep. And that's why I asked you, you know, you had, did you predetermine these six or seven spots? Because that's really similar for me. You know, for I'm using my bugle, primarily archery, so I'm out trying to, to locate an elk that's bugling. But on my phone, I will have identified all these waypoints of this basin has everything I'm looking for to get a bugle. I'm going to go up this ridge. I'm going to get up here. I'm going to bugle down in there, and I'm going to get a response. And if I don't, I don't sit there and think, well, I'm going to sit here until an elk answers me. <laughs> it is. I pull up the phone. I look for waypoint number two, and I say, okay, it's four miles this way. We've got to get on this ridge and get over there because there's a basin over there that has a beautiful bench, and there's a lake down in there. Let's get over there and bugle off that ridge, and we go to that. And so that's, for me, you know, that's that's having three or four spots within an area is important, identified ahead of time. And outside of that, I want three or four areas that I might have to hike back to the truck and get in and drive 15 miles right. to a whole other drainage. And the next morning, get up from there, hike up into there, and I go to waypoint number one, waypoint number two, waypoint number three in that area hitting these different pockets. And I think what it comes from is I grew up in central Idaho, north central Idaho. There was logging all over. There were clear cuts. We had family areas that, you know, I just went hunted from the time I was little. So in high school, I went back to those familiar areas. And if I didn't find an elk, I was back there in that same area the next Friday night, hiking the exact same loop we had always done. And that's mm. not a very effective way yeah. to kill elk. And as I started branching out a little bit more and realizing, you know, I go to these areas. Uh, we talked about my Utah hunt that I burned 10 points on in the book cliffs. I went there and we got stuck in a rut. And it wasn't the kind of rut you want to be stuck in in September. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind being stuck in the rut, but I was stuck in a rut. And we did the same thing day after day, just thinking the elk have to show up. This right. is where they've always rutted for the last three seasons of, of experience and intelligence from other people. They'll show up, just stay here and keep doing the same thing. And it goes back to that definition of insanity. You know, <laughs> finally on day eight, it clicked. And it's like, what am I doing? We have to change things up. We went to a new area. The party was going on there. But at that point, it was almost too late. We got lucky and shot one on the last evening. But it's, you know, for me, I realized then... I need to have my primary. This is the area that I want to go and hunt. But if the elk aren't there for whatever reason, I don't go back to camp and scratch my head and waste a day thinking, well, let's go learn the, the area and try to find another spot. Yeah. I've got six backup areas that I can go to. Yeah. And if there's not elk in number one, I'm in number two. You know, people ask me all the time, how long do you wait? How long that's do you I, give that's it? That's what I was going to say. You I know, get that question all the time. Yeah. How long do you give that area? If I'm in there... And there is no sign, and I'm not getting any bugles. I'll be back out by ten in the morning, going somewhere else. Yeah. And and I'm talking. I used to bivy hunt. I don't bivy hunt hardly at all anymore, unless I know an area is productive. Because yeah. so many times I've been burned spending a day hiking in, a day looking for elk, another day hiking out. Half of my hunt's over, yep. and I haven't even found elk yet. Yeah. I want to be as mobile as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I get that question a lot. I think. Uh, in a future podcast, we should talk more about how long do you hunt an area or a spot? Because to me, an area is a general location. Yep. I'm looking for what I call spots or spot on the spot. Yep. Because there there might be an area, a general area that's a basin. And then within, that you can always get an elk to bugle from. Right. Then you've got spots within that basin that, okay, you know, there's usually an elk here, an yeah. elk there. Here's the bench that they bed on. Here's the knob that this bull is on pre-rut. Yeah. Right. So uh, I can't say that I have a hard and fast rule that, oh, I've been here for eight hours. I gave up on this spot. A lot of it is just <laughs> what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I'm what I'm catching for signs, seeing fresh rubs, whatever it is. You know, okay, that was my preferred spot, but there's so many people over there. I'm not going over there. So I usually judge it by my little baggie of fruit snacks. And <laughs> if I get bored enough to stop and eat them once they're gone, I realize that the elk hunting's not very good because if the elk hunting's good, I don't drink water or eat anything all day. We're just chasing elk. And <laughs> well, my number four isn't... Uh, my, my one, two, and four all kind of fit together, and that was an emphasis on gadgets. 
uh, and distinguishing gadgets from gear. I, I I went through this phase that I like I said in the earlier podcast of I I just thought I don't need a plan I don't need to study I don't need to do my research don't need to talk to scientists or biologists I just need to buy another item I had closets full of elk hunting paraphernalia whatever <laughs> you want to call it and the more I spent. I still, I mean, I didn't have enough money to keep up with how many solutions I thought I could buy. And I throw all those in the gadget category. And then I started having a little success and thinking this through. And then as I became more of a student of elk, I realized that gadgets are like the downfall. They're, they're like... Uh, I don't know in the human world what would be a, a good analogy to use, but it, it's they're like a facade. They they make you the feel yeah yeah it's a snake oil kind of thing. And then you've got gear, which for me gear is a tool. I'm going to use it. I'm going to abuse it. I want the best I can afford. I'm just you know I, I'm like you. I I want what works for yeah. my hunting style, and I don't want. So you're, you're telling me my knife that I wear on my, my belt with the compass on top and all the matches mm. stuffed up inside of it and the little foldable saw and the fish hook and everything, is that yeah, a gadget? that's a gadget. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Corey. Yeah, I'll leave it at camp next time. Yeah, I, I would do that. That's a gadget. <laughs> now, things like, ah, I can't say this because that's a company. And it, I was going to say, it's and, hard to, to find yeah. specific examples but. without getting in trouble yeah um no i i <laughs> some of the things people have sent me that are quote unquote <laughs> gadgets a guy sent me a saw and it, it was in like this uh, long tube about eight inches long and i think he meant really well and for the white tail world it might have worked great and it had like a screw off top it was about a one inch diameter tube the blade dropped down in there, you screw the top back on, and on the bottom side was a spot where the blade would connect. So it's kind of like you're holding this tube in your hand with a blade out on that. Hand saw. Yeah. yeah. Well, as you're walking, that blade is <laughs> clanking and banging inside that tube. Drove me nuts. That's a gadget. But you could have fixed that. That's, that's, a, that's feedback you could have given to him. I and did. you could have said, and while you're at it, put a flashlight bulb on one end uh-huh. and, a, and a compass on the other end. There you and go. See, now we've got tools all added together and it's gear. Yeah, well, I, I tried my best. He, he, <laughs> he seemed like a really knowledgeable guy and I think he appreciated the feedback, but there's just so many things that are gadgets. Yep. I, you know, all but this. But you can't this. fault. I mean, that's the, the entrepreneur spirit. Oh, it is. That, yeah. you know, sometimes you hit a home run with mm-hmm. something and yeah. you just I, never I know. Mean, and I, I admit that I'm guilty of this when, because we run into hunters out in the woods a lot and I'm instantly eyeing them up and down. Like how many gadgets they <laughs> how got? How serious is this guy? <laughs> right. You know, does he have a Bowie knife strapped to his belt, but also tied around down by his ankle or something, you know? <laughs> With a scent wafer tied to the back of his hat. Mm. Yeah. All that kind of, I'm yeah. like, all right, I, I, I shouldn't be that way. Because I've been there. So I've got to tell you a story. I've, I've been there. I get it. But for me, I, I guess people, it, it takes time and and some commitment to knowledge to get away from the, the allure of gadgetry. Yep. So I'll leave it at that. So um, and speaking of, speaking of, yeah, so uh, this is like David Burdett is getting a lot of storytelling well, time. I and he's not, David he, we're going to we're, we're gonna have to get him on the podcast. We've got to fly him out here. So we hunted Arizona with a uh, good friend, Steve Chapel one year. Uh-huh. And Steve had a tag and we went down and just, I mean, we scouted, we called, we just hung out with him while he was hunting. And I don't remember if it was before or after he had shot his bull on that hunt. We, uh, David and I synced up with somebody else that had a tag there that we had no idea who they were. They just pulled into camp and they were talking to Steve and we went over and he's like, yeah, we've been getting into elk, but I can't call them in. And, you know, I, I like to call elk. Mm -hmm. So we'll go with you. Yeah. So we head out there and we get out and this guy has, uh, you know, you talk about stereotyping hunters. Yeah. He was the maybe 10 or 15 years behind the times hunter. Yeah. 
And, you know, this but was... But that's all right. It, totally fine. This might yeah. have been mid-2000s, and he was still wearing tree bark camouflage. And, you know, I mean, yeah. just little ways technologically back there. But he had, when he got out and started hiking, he had a great big Cowan Heat scent wafer tied with a string to the back of his hat. And so as he's walking, it's bobbing back and forth, hitting him in the back of the neck there. And you could smell it. We're walking with the wind in our face and back 20 yards behind him, you could smell that offensive smell of yeah. that cow in heat. And uh, we stopped at one point, we're taking a break and evidently he had taken his hat off yeah. and set it down. And unbeknownst to any of us, I won't say who did it, but somebody in our group went up there and cut the string on that wafer. So we get <laughs> 200 or 300 yards up the trail. And this guy that we're with is all of a sudden looking around. He's like, I lost my wafer. I lost my wafer. And we can't, we're going to be able to get close to these elk now. And it was kind of a panic situation for a bit. But I looked over at Burdette and he just had that smirk on his face. And he knew exactly where the wafer had disappeared to. <laughs> uh, we will call that a gadget. That was a gadget. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just think, you know... <clears throat> You got this little disc hanging off the back of your bat. We talked about, or the back of your hat. We talked about thermals. And if that elk can smell the scent coming off of that wafer, he can smell, he you. Can smell the stink coming off you. And yeah. he can differentiate between the two. Yeah, they're, they're dialed in on that. So your number three item that we skipped, what we'll have left is our number five. I hope we, we have enough. Can we cover three more in 15 minutes? I can. I'll be fast. All right. Ooh, this is a tough one. I know. I, I, we might have to... Do we have to cover three more? What do we Yeah, on? we got to do setups, which is your number three. Calling mistakes, Ooh. which is your number five. Yeah. I don't think you can cover those in 15. Let's, uh, let's hold setups back for another uh, podcast because right. that's almost a podcast in itself. All right. Setup. Podcast number whatever. Coming up. All right. And I'm making notes here. Later podcast. All right. Then. And the reason there's so much involved there is I did, I wrote an article several years ago and I titled it The Setup, mm -hmm. Elk Hunting's Critical Conjuncture. And it's just really, I feel the point where everything comes together and you're successful or everything falls apart and you fail. Yeah. And so there's so many things there that I think we could do a whole podcast just talking about setups, how to set up, why it's important, what to look for, what an elk's looking for as they come into the setup and... Cool. In, in 15 minutes, we aren't going to be able to even right. do justice then, then to let's, it. Let's not shortchange the audience. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we have a limit on how many podcasts we can ask them to listen to. There. <laughs> you know. I was going to say, our only limit is how many people will actually listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know that right now. We're just, we we're just making we're just podcasts. We're making it up. And, yeah. yeah. We, we told the sponsors, oh, yeah, we're going to have a million downloads. Like guaranteed. Yeah, guaranteed or your money back. <laughs> Wait, have, you told them they got their money back? Well, we didn't charge them very much. So. I was going to say, we got money coming? Well, no. This is a new yet. business idea for us. I know. They, I, we need enough money for tags and gas. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Yeah. I used so. to just want enough money for a Snickers bar and a bag of trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you said your wife's out shopping today. She is. We might need some. Need, she knew there was a Costco here in Missoula. So. Well, that's what you get for living in the sticks. I know. All right. Calling mistakes. Do we have enough time to talk about calling mistakes? Hmm. Probably not, but we can at least touch on it. What's right. your, what, not, what do you have left? Afraid to experiment. Why don't you touch on that? Okay. I kind of touched on it yeah. uh, when I talked about lack of a plan. Uh, and it, it's, whether it's later in the hunt or just sometimes I will go out, especially it's a, if it's in my home turf, I'll get these crazy ideas in my head because <laughs> I've watched one of Corey's videos out on the elk you don't University. get crazy ideas from me or i've heard something and i'm like you know i gotta go try that i i just gotta go try it or there's certain biases i have in how i hunt like i hate hunting in the wind and i hate hunting in the rain i just i'm old and lazy so because it's uncomfortable yeah sometimes i will force myself to go do something i'm uncomfortable with and I will go do something in what seems like such a stupid manner, such a stupid way that if my friends saw me, they'd probably laugh at me <laughs> and say, oh, man, I saw Newberg doing this today. What a was... knucklehead. <laughs> um, so sometimes by design. Can you give me an example? I, I mean, last year, 
I woke up one morning and it was just drizzling, terrible, nasty rain. I called the crew and said, let's go elk hunting this morning. And they're like, really? You hate to hunt in the rain? I said, I know. Let's go. And we called in elk. Uh, what I found is, you know what? You can get a lot closer to them in the rain. Um, the scent or the, the wind and the thermals seem way more consistent throughout the day in the yeah. rain. Uh, it's the, almost like the, the sense dampened a little right. bit. There's more ambient noise in the woods of the raindrops hitting the the leaves and, yeah. and other stuff. It, it Like, wow, I can get by with a lot more. Why have I not hunted? Why, why do I hate hunting in the rain? <laughs> well, because I just do. Yeah. So uh, that, that was an example. We called in a really, really nice six by seven to my buddy Bart and uh, it, it was, I've heard you talk about Bart before yeah we, we should have him on a podcast but uh, we went up there and uh, this is one of your aggressive things that I learned from you is this bull was bugling and it was you could tell he was out on this little point about 200 yards from us I told Bart you go around that way I'm just going to sit here I'm going to make every ugly whiny cow call and when he bugles I'm not even going to let him finish I'm just going to wipe him out and I make these whiny cow calls and he's just letting her rip and I start easing closer to him and I I can hear Bart slightly out in front of me and slightly downwind and finally like you told me one time sometimes you just got to make them mad and so I went and got this big stick and I am beating <laughs> on the tree and the, when he, he heard that raking the tree I mean this was more than raking this yeah. was like skitter kind of direction yeah <laughs> and when he bugled i cut him right off in the middle and he's like i've had enough and i can hear him coming and uh he came out like 10 yards from bart but when he stepped out he, he in this little opening bart thought he's gonna pass through that opening instead of step right into it face on and as quick as he peek through yeah. well here's a camera and bart i mean it's really thick so an opening 10 yards wide was a big opening for this place. Uh, but I forced myself to go do something that I normally wouldn't do. And now the next time it's a misty, drizzly, rainy morning, I'm probably going to go out there. <laughs> so that, that's an example of it. Um, a lot of times when we're on a hunt and it's getting to day four, day five, uh, I'll do the Hail Mary, for lack of a better term. One time I had a tag in Wyoming, Unit 19, uh, which is a pretty decent elk hunting unit. And, man, I'd hunted my butt off. I couldn't catch a break. I'm like, you know what? I just got to go up, face the wind, and accept the fact that that wind is going to be in my face so I can glass into those kind of protected slopes, glassing yeah. across this big canyon. I hardly even had my spotter set up and I spotted two bulls. So much for hating hunting in the wind, <laughs> Randy. I, I, my bias of hating to hunt in the wind, I didn't let myself go to some of these places the first, you know, whatever, because the last three days it was just windy as all get out. Yep. Well, you're looking for the same cover the elk are and you aren't going to be able to find the elk if you're on the... On the side, side trying to glass. Right. So I didn't want to do it. I told the camera, I said, this is going to be miserable. I don't know if we're tough enough to stay here for more than about a half hour. Well, we didn't have to stay there for a half hour. Yep. We dropped off that ridge, snuck down there, and I shot that bull. He, I shot the smaller one. They're bedded right there. Uh, but the bigger one wouldn't get out of his bed. And I'm like, you know what? Bird in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> so I shot the five by six. <laughs> I think we got within 260 yards. End of story. Yep. Now, if I would have let my biases and my kind of discomforts or comforts dictate and keep doing the same thing for the last day and a half that yep. I'd done the first, whatever, three and a half, four days. You got the same results. Yeah. So to me, that's uh, being afraid of experimenting. I've made some of my stupidest mistakes experimenting and it helps confirm that those are really dumb ideas. <laughs> and so I don't need to experiment with that dumb idea again next time. But every once in a while, you learn something. And now it's it's just another bit of that elk experience, elk information that I've got in my head of, hey. It's another this. reference it, point. Yeah. Yep. Don't be afraid to do this again if you run into those same conditions or, yep. you know, whatever. So what about... 
you talked about gear and gadgets. Mm-hmm. What about experimenting with gadgets? I mean, there's... I experiment with so much stuff. I, like you probably, I get sent a package a day of stuff. And I will try everything. I mean, there is nothing I won't try. You want to give out but, your address here on the podcast no. so people can send you stuff? <laughs> I'm in the Bozeman phone book. So <laughs> I'm one of those people who still has a landline because my mom's or my wife's mom likes us to have a landline. But <laughs> we don't need to go into that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll experiment with gadgets and doodads and gizmos and uh, any any kind of gear someone sends me, I'll experiment with it. But I'll experiment with it critically and skeptically. Yeah. And I do, now I'm at that phase in my, my elk hunting experiences that I have enough confidence that I don't have to rely on uh, a gadget to fill my gap yep. because I've done my research, my homework, my study, and I've had the benefit now of many years of experience. But uh, you can send me anything. Yeah. I'll if try it. If it increases the success or... Yeah, Gives I'm trying advantage. to think what the most recent gadget is that I got. I, I, off the top you know, of my I'll head. tell you, and and uh, hopefully Kurt takes this the right way. But Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls has mm. a rattle cage, yeah. and I have not used it yet. Right for elk, mm-hmm. for deer, yeah. I mean, rattling deer is, but they have a rattle cage for elk, and so I'm yeah. going to give it a try this fall, just yeah. to try. Mm-hmm. And you know, for whitetail deer, there's no doubt rattling is an effective strategy right. when you think about it. Elk are fighting, you know, they're going to come to the, the same thing. So it'll be interesting to to give that a try. It's small enough that it's not going to weigh me down a bunch. And I can throw it in my pack. And if we get in a setup, yeah. I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. Well, a lot of people have watched our videos out on our YouTube channel or our Amazon channel have seen me wearing these antelope hats. I thought at first, that, so this is... I. I I shoot this little buck antelope in Montana. I come home. I have this old, miserable-looking cap. I ask my wife, can you figure out a way to sew those <laughs> antelope horns onto my cap? She tries it. Well, I can't get the horns to sit up yeah. right. They keep falling down or off to the side. The hat falls off. Well, I think it was 2009 or 10. Uh, I, this guy in Bozeman, Mark, starts his company called Be the Decoy. Yep. And uh, I call him up. I'm like, genius, man. I My wife made me a hat like that <laughs> 10 years ago, but can I try it? He's like, you'd really try that? I'm like, oh, darn right. Went out there, me and Bryce DeForest, man, we're arrow and antelope like crazy. <laughs> The first time we used it, we're on a county road outside of Daddle, New Mexico, and the antelope are out there about 300 yards, so we park the truck, and the camera and Bryce stay right by, keep the the truck behind them so the antelope don't see a lot of human movement. I said, I'm going to sneak right out there, Lauren, put this big zoom lens on and just march it out there as I move. Well, I'm getting closer and closer. I pop my head up and there's five bucks and they start coming towards me. I'm like, oh man, this is so good. <laughs> and they're coming closer and closer and they're now, they're like, I think it's like 90 yards and they're on, they're moving in. And all of a sudden I hear all kinds of doors slamming and banging. And I'm like, come on. I, I'm thinking it's my guys. I look back on the county road. There's like four trucks parked there looking at me like, what is this knucklehead doing? <laughs> or fortunately, they weren't putting a stock on you. No, they were just, they stopped. <laughs> They're watching. So now there's so many people at the county road that they ended up scaring the antelope off. But yeah, in, in spite of all the humiliation that people chuckled and laughed, guess what? I filled they three were. antelope tags <laughs> with that outfit. So uh, Plus you have a Halloween costume. I, exactly, yeah. yeah. Dual purpose. That's right. Yeah. So that's uh, that's one of those, I guess, experiment. Not afraid to experiment. That some might say is gadgetry. Yeah. Um, it worked, but uh, yeah. I went out and tried it. My my homemade hat didn't work with a darn. I, but the idea, the See, idea, the idea and then just when needed I saw to develop. It, right. When I saw it a few years later, I'm like, uh huh. That, that guy is onto a better. He built a better mousetrap. <laughs> I'm gonna go do that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, in the rifle world experimenting, I, I was of the opinion that you needed a 300 win mag or a 338 to kill an elk. I, I don't know why I'd killed five of them with my 270 and they yeah. were, when I walked up there, they were all the way dead. dead. 
You know, they they were dead dead. Yep. But got it in my head. I needed a 300 win mag, so I went and bought one, and guess what? They work great. Killed them just as dead. Yep. So now I'm back to shooting them with a 308, this little 308 case, and I shoot them, and they're just dead. You know, I just actually bought a rifle. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm going to be a rifle hunter. Oh, wow. After I... my experience wolf hunting this winter, I realized... Uh -huh. Archery is awesome and it has its place, and I will shoot a wolf with my bow. Yeah, but it's going to take a long time. I realize, <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm in the process of setting up a, a rifle. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, seven mm, seven mm, or seven yeah. mm oh eight. No, just seven mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were in Alaska two weeks ago. We shot two humongous black bears with seven mm oh eight. Yep. So, and actually, this isn't experimenting, but rifles and ammos and stuff. Uh, this idea of the five biggest elk hunting mistakes, the folks at Nosler are the ones who planted that seed in my head. Somewhere, somehow, someone's got to do the five <laughs> greatest elk hunting mistakes. So now I can call Mason and Pat and Cheryl at Nosler and say, here you have it, yeah. folks. These are the greatest mistakes we still make. Yeah. But I think it's important, you know, as we as we wrap up this, because we probably... Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we got 31 seconds oh. before it, it hits the two-hour mark. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. But we're, anyhow... We're long-winded. We are. I, mean, I think uh, failures are a huge part of elk hunting. Yeah. And I think it comes back to mental toughness, perseverance, attitude... And realistic expectations because you will fail every day that you hunt elk. Mm -hmm. Every single day there will be a failure at some level. And hopefully it's not <laughs> catastrophic, but there will be failures. Yeah. And those can mentally grind on a person oh, yeah. to the point where you just want to give up. And, and yeah. I talk about, you know, I've got three children who are right now 15, 13, and 11. Um, my wife, I'm quite confident I like her a lot more than she likes me. <laughs> So that draws me back home, you know, during hunting season. But all of these things, you know, you're, you're behind on work and yep. we own our own businesses. So if we aren't there taking care of it, it's falling, the wheels are falling yeah. off. It's no just a matter vacation. of, yeah. And so you add all that up and mentally after four or five or six or seven days of failures and failures and failures, and you're giving it all you have and it just doesn't come together, you're missing home, you're missing your family, work is you know, on the back of your mind. It's really easy to throw in the towel. Yeah. And I think going into an elk hunt, realizing that there are going to be mistakes and realizing that they're temporary. Yeah. All of these mistakes we've talked about are temporary and can be overcome. Yeah. Maybe not to 100% consistency, but we can overcome them. And I think going into an elk hunt and understanding that and having a, an attitude of overcoming obstacles, overcoming failures, overcoming mistakes and persevering, that's that's where success is found. Yeah. And you can't just go out and expect to sit at the edge of a meadow and be successful that first night every time. Right. It might happen. Yeah. Or unlikely, but it, it might. Yeah. I I gave a presentation. Boone and Crockett asked me to go to their uh, national... Uh, they have a, every three years, they have this convention. And they have an evening where all of the youth hunters who have entered animals get invited and uh, a lot of them showed up with their parents. And Boone and Crockett said, Randy, will you give the keynote that night? I'm like, man, I'd <laughs> way like rather, pressure. Yeah, I'd way rather be us a bunch of old, you <laughs> yeah. know, gray hairs. Than these these be, people are impressionable. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I got up there, uh, I talked about how hunting, and this gets to your point of mistakes, is probably the best life experience activity of, of my life. Yeah. Uh, I know I'm going to fail nine out of 10 times or 19 out of 20 times. And I think about how that discipline, that acceptance of failure, that uh, grabbing the challenge and still going forward and not giving up is so helpful in my business life and my advocacy life and all the other things I do. Yeah. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's not giving up. I will not give up. I, I mean, if I was in, I mean, I'd get my butt whooped in the old <laughs> MMA thing, but they'd probably kill me. I, I wouldn't tap out. I, I, I'm just that bullheaded. So, I, and I was given this presentation about, you know, don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of mistakes. And what you've done in hunting, 
in your young adult or young lives, when you become adults, all of these experiences about accepting challenges you think you can't overcome, about having failed, tried and failed, uh, picking yourself up off the ground, being humbled, being uh, outsmarted by something that supposedly is not as smart as we are. <laughs> I mean, there's all these things that hunting teaches us yep. that I think become really valuable life skills as we go older. And that whole idea that, that you were talking about of just accepting failures for what they are. I mean, that, yep. that no, I think, sense. you know, you, you get winded, you miss a shot. I mean, that's the worst. Yeah. You get, you finally, everything comes together. And then we're talking, you know, over the counter general tags, public land. When you get a shot, that might be your shot for the season. Right. And when that comes together and you miss mm -hmm. or something happens, falls apart right before you shoot and you don't get the shot, that's crushing. Yeah. And it would be really easy to throw in the towel and give up. And yeah. that, that's a permanent failure. I mean, it's not permanent in the whole right. scheme of eternity, but that's but. a permanent for the next 11 months. You have given up and you have to live with that. Yeah. And you never know. I can't, I mean, you know as well as I do how many animals have fallen victim to us on the last day of a hunt. And if we had given <laughs> so up just right. the night before or even the last morning and not hunted the last evening and went home, uh, it wouldn't have happened. And I yeah. think that perseverance through those trials is number so of people important. who say, why do you guys always shoot them on the last day? <laughs> well, it's not because we tried to. Right? <laughs> this it's isn't like, scripted. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell those elk to behave, we'll gladly shoot yeah. them opening morning. But, and uh, the other part for me is with this failure stuff and how it applies to life is, you know, a lot of people say, well, life isn't fair. And, and it's right. There is no fairness in life. There's good luck. There's bad luck. Sometimes you get things you don't deserve. And sometimes you don't get the things you do deserve. And nothing exemplifies that life reality like hunting. There's sometimes I've killed an elk that I did not deserve. It's like that day I could have sat in camp and that elk would have came and crawled <laughs> in the tent and said, please shoot me. It was that lucky. Yep. And there will be hunts where I've hunted my butt off for 10 days and I feel like I deserve one. Yep. Where, where's the lot? Where's the justice in, in this? Murphy's got your number and yeah. he's throwing every, every option at you he can. Same as in life and business and everything else, you know, yep. there, there is no quote unquote justice. I always work hard and persevere. Yeah. So before we wrap up, you got to answer the, oh, that's the right. uh, question of the week, but I'm going to, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to get into this example of our MEF mission. Okay. So it'll give you some time to think about it. Uh, how do you determine your camp location? is the Sitka question of the week. And while Corey's thinking about how he's going to answer that, I want to talk about a project that actually happens to be here in Montana. It was called the Red Hill Project. And RMEF had a member who had a soft spot for wild places and wild things. And uh, this couple, uh, Marshall and Leslie Long, uh, owned this 40-acre piece that had a little bit of an overlap uh, instead of having a corner cross, it actually had a like a 30-yard overlap leading into a huge chunk of national forest. Every other piece of private that had that surrounded controlled the access. But their little piece, the county road came through, the I think, the northeast corner, and then it overlapped 30 yards wide on the southwest corner with the Forest Service. And RMEF, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks all pooled their resources. I think a couple other partners, but RMEF was who put the deal together. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I think it it's a 40-acre piece that when it was all said and done, it opened up access to over almost 20,000 acres wow. of, of public land that, yeah, before, if you could ride horses 20 miles, you could have got to. But not a lot of us are going to ride horses 20 miles, let alone hike 20 miles. So, so it was locked up by that private piece. By all that neighbors. And so these people said, you know what? The public needs access to this land. The Longs sold it to RMEF at a screaming deal. And so for the purchase of 40 acres, the hunters of, well, all Americans, yeah. I mean, anyone who wants to. Uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks now owns a parcel, maintains a trailhead there. And there's a trail leading from that, going way up back into the, I think that's on the Lewis and Clark National Forest up in the big snowies. Um, 
Um, we, we call it the Red Hill Project here in Montana, but it's it's just one more example of the Elk Foundation. They're 11,000 volunteers. They're 228,000 members putting their time, their money, their advocacy in place yeah. for us. All I'd us. love to see that the the number of members grow, but more importantly, the number of volunteers. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, where the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation could do more if there were more volunteers. Yeah. And, you know, in your state, wherever you're listening from, there's probably a project. Yeah. And, Whether it's you know, a project, the committee, get a hold of your state chairman or your local committee. Yeah. There, there's always projects. Trust me, there's yeah. <laughs> never a shortage of projects. <laughs> so if it's just the morning going out and pulling fence or helping with a weed control project or uh, rebuilding a water structure, whatever yeah. it is, go do it and know that you're you're fulfilling the tagline RMEF has that hunting is conservation. Absolutely. So, so with that, Corey, how do you determine your camp location? So there's there's two trains of thought there. I guess, you know, when you asked that question, the first thing that went to my mind was we talked about how we hunt from a base camp primarily mm-hmm. and we're mobile. Right. Uh, so for, for that kind of hunting, it's not as critical. I look for a place that's close to water because I like to be able to wash my hands or, you know, run out and bathe every seven days or whatever it is. <laughs> so, I mean, camping near a water source is always a benefit. Yeah. And then I look at my six or seven backup areas and I try to find a, a location that's central to those so that I can easily access those without having to move camp. Because once you get a base camp set up, right. you don't want to spend a few hours pulling it down, moving it. So I find a central location. But I think... This question probably was more aimed at like a spike camp or a bivy camp type okay. location. And that comes back to thermals. Yeah. And everything about if you're in the back country or if you're just, if you have camp on your back and you're looking to go and hunt and then set up camp that night, uh, you find a group of elk, you don't want to camp on the ridge right above where those elk are. Because no. think about what thermals are doing. 90% of the time when you're at camp, thermals are moving downhill. Yeah. And you're there... After dark, you're up the next morning at daylight. That entire time, thermals are moving downhill. If you're camped on that ridge overlooking the drainage that you're hearing bulls bugling right at dark, they're not going to be bugling there the next morning, probably. (laughs) They'll be bugling somewhere else, but it won't be there. Yeah. So I always like to back off away. If there's a drainage, I know there's elk in. I get back off the backside of that ridge, make sure the thermals are going down 180 degrees away, opposite direction of where that is. And then just find a, a good place there. But I don't push it. I'm back in there. If I'm bivy hunting, it's because I want to be close to the elk. And I want to be mm-hmm. on the elk first thing instead of hiking six miles in to right. be in there. But I don't want to hike six miles in and camp there and scare them out. Yep. So definitely take the, the cautionary side. Be back from them. Use thermals to dictate camp location. Make sure that the times you're at camp, the thermals are not going anywhere near those elk. And it usually... You can just get back one ridge, just one little finger ridge. The thermals are moving down as long as the elk are in a basin or a pocket yeah. over there. As fun as it is to sit on a ridge and lay in a tent, listen to elk bugle all night, yeah, it's uh, that's not going to be no. conducive to success <laughs> the next day. Yeah, I get, like you, I get asked the question so much. And most of the time people are asking about a backpack, baby towel style camp. And for me, I tell people, look, I've worked really hard to locate elk. The last thing I want to do is blow them out of there. <laughs> Just relocate them. <laughs> yeah. So I tell people, I usually will move in. And I say I try to be about a mile away from wherever I know that is. I want to be probably a 45 minute hike away from yeah. there. Uh, and like you, I'll go find a, a different, just off the other side or further down the drainage or, or something, yep. some place where I feel comfortable that whatever the wind's doing, I'm not like right in their face stinking it up. Yep. If because there's an errant wind or a storm comes in and the wind changes direction, I don't want to be laying in my tent going, oh, I wonder if they can smell me. I want to be <laughs> at a safe distance. Right. Have a buffer there. Yeah. And that gets back to you, one of the, the comments about uh, aggressive versus passive hunting. Uh, I'm not as aggressive when I'm doing a bivy camp because if I blow them out, yeah. I can't be as mobile to go find more elk. Whereas yeah. if I'm at a base camp hunt, like you, I've got four or five general areas within a 20-minute drive of trailheads or whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay, if I mess something up over in spot A, I can probably go find elk in B, C, or D. And 
I, I'm like you. I, I'm doing more base camp hunts than I yeah. am bivy hunt. Part of it is because I'm getting old and been there, done that. Uh, I need some of the fineries of life. <laughs> uh, but And we're going to get into backcountry, or not necessarily backcountry, but elk camp meals. Mm-hmm. But Randy has some of the best meals at camp. Yeah, thanks to Kim Newberg. Yeah. Thanks to my wife. I, uh, it opened my eyes to a whole new way of eating yeah. at elk camps. So. Yeah. So... Did Traeger send you a grill? They did. They're sending us a traveling grill. What? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. we'll have some really good meals. Man. Let's forget that. <laughs> so, where, where are we hunting yeah. and when? Yeah, Jomer, he's like, if I sent you one of those little traveling grills, would you use it? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> would I ever? <laughs> yeah, here's my address. What, what are you waiting for? Yeah. So, well, folks, Corey, I, I, I think... Uh, if there is anyone still listening, we owe them a debt of gratitude. We're going to have to pack their elk out for them or something. See, there you go, talking without thinking through this. We can't be guaranteeing that we're going to be there and packing people's elk out for them. I didn't say we. I was oh. implying you. I'm going to pull up lame. You know, I got this ache in my knee. I was uh, hoping that you were going to say, for anybody that's still listening, we're going to get into setups and calling and how mistakes can that change that's success for next and failure. Time. I know. So, well, I think the next time we'll be doing this is at the Total Archery Challenge. Yeah. I wonder who we can rope into being guests there. Yeah, we like can find some people, guinea pig. People are probably tired of us talking. I know they're tired of me talking. Maybe not you, but so. But we'll find some. If we could crank out three of them there. Then I think I'm going to I'm going to sniff out where you're going elk hunting in Wyoming and I'm just going to impose myself on your camp perfect and who all is going there with you dirk and donnie yep dirk and donnie and i are heading to wyoming and well i'll call those guys they'll tell me yeah come on i'll bring they will i'll bring some of my wife's good cooking i was gonna say you bring your traveling traeger and you might have an invitation for an (laughs) hour or two so dirk and donnie are, are do you dare put a headset on those guys oh yeah okay yeah no absolutely okay I, I, I don't, yeah. I mean, I don't know how they're, how they are in hunting season. You no, know, they're, they? they're great. I just put okay. a disclaimer out there. Anything they say is not true because they, they like oh, to, okay. I mean, they, they are pretty bad. They're pretty harsh on me and they say a lot really? of untrue things about missing. Really? You know, they'll, they'll probably tell stories about me missing uh-huh. elk that are completely fabricated. Oh, well, I'm um, not going to stand for any of that. Yeah. I'll defend your It'll be nice to have somebody there on my side. Yeah. It's pretty well, outnumbered. My goodness, a guy. <laughs> I can't believe you'd even go to camp with people who pick on you like that. Yeah, that's good worse than so I use them. Yeah, that's worse than camera crew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, folks, we appreciate you listening. A couple things we want to uh, give you other spots. Corey has the University of Elk Hunting. Uh, where do they, do they go to elk Yeah, just to elk101.com, click on the link for the online course. And uh, Randy helped me with, with several parts of that. And it's 17 modules, I think 54 chapters. And it's all aimed at every aspect of elk hunting to increase success, regardless yeah. of previous experience. Yeah, and then you've got the forum at elk101.com. Yeah, we have a forum there. We actually are also going to be releasing three mini courses for uh, Mm. anybody can go and sign up and you enter your experience level and based on experience level, it will walk you through free mini courses uh, aimed at giving you the information based on your experience level to get you to the next level. And they can just go to elk101.com forward slash success to access those free mini courses. Cool. Instagram, you want anyone to find you on Instagram? Yeah, that's great. There would be uh, seven followers, I think, then. So, yeah. yeah that'd oh, be, great. Yeah. What, what would that be? It's just CoreyJacobson.Elk101. Or they can follow Elk101. CoreyJacobson.Elk101 is my personal one. Okay. And then there's just at Elk101. Okay. To follow Elk101 there. Any other place they should... I could give my Look, PO yeah. box, but oh, yeah, that's... I got that on weird. my phone here if anyone wants it. <laughs> uh, what about you? Uh, uh, for me, we have two Instagram pages now. The the crew, my, my camera crew started Fresh Tracks TV as one. And then there's my personal one, which... Uh, I th- Last time I kind of feigned that I don't know anything about Instagram, I do it occasionally. But I do have <laughs> someone who helps me. She's really good. And that one is at Randy Newberg Hunter. Um, and then, like your forum, I have the Hunt Talk forum. 
um, huntdoc.com. And then we've got our YouTube channel, uh, Randy Newberg Hunter. And really our, our big thing for this year, and I wish Amazon would approve our next three episodes, but we are, are if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can watch all of our Fresh Tracks episodes for free out on Amazon. That's awesome. Very high quality. I was going to say, and in high definition quality. HD, no commercials. And the new ones we're doing, we're making them 30, 40 minutes long. So it's however long the story requires. Yep. And uh, that's a lot of fun doing that. Um, other places, I don't even tell people about my Facebook page because, I <laughs> one, I don't do Facebook message. And I yeah, get, I'm so bad. At that. Uh, I get hundreds and hundreds of Facebook messages, and people are mad at me. And I, on every platform I have, I say, "Don't send me a Facebook no. message." And I, if it wasn't for the requirement of me keeping a Facebook account, I'd delete it. Yep. And so. that's the hard part. Is you know, for me, it's we're a small business. Elk 101 yeah. is a small business. And when yeah. I say small, I'm talking me in the corner of a room that I rent from a friend type of a small business. Mm. And I honestly just don't have the bandwidth to be on Facebook and even Instagram for, for some degree. I'm not really active there. And I'll have people email me and say, you're a jerk. I'm, I'm, I want my money back from the online course. I've sent you a message and you never even answered it. Or that's not the way to contact me. I have a right. contact form on the website that emails me. I will see that. So yeah, don't, don't message us on social media if you need something. Yeah. I try to yeah. go through them, but then I realized the other day, if I'm not following someone or we aren't connected or something mm-hmm. on Facebook Messenger, right. it goes to a whole other folder, and I've got thousands of messages yeah. in there that it, I didn't know were there. It just says 99 plus, I can yeah. tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, You're dealing with a couple of non-social media people here. Yeah. We'll do our best to, to right. keep some updates out there, but if you really need to get a hold of us, yeah. Well, I hope people will give us ideas because we've, when we started planning this, we put together our ideas of what we thought people would want to listen to. Uh, we want the, what they want for guests. Uh, we'll probably have to get into some gear stuff. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to get into, well, we can continue on. We already said we're going to talk more about setups. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk calling. more about calling mistakes. Yeah. Sounds and calling strategy. Sounds, sounds, sounds to me like you get to just, I'll, I'll, I'll just sit back and eat Dairy Queen on the next podcast. <laughs> you, you can do, you can take it, man. No, you can, you can uh, interject and say that's not true. That's not really what he did. That might be in a perfect world, but I watched him do this. And, okay. All uh, right. I, I mean, I talk about what would be ideal, but it's hunting and sometimes yeah. you, you don't get the ideal. Well, whatever people take from this, I hope what they do is go hunting this fall. Yep. Don't sit at home talking about it. I, my motto in everything I write, and if you go out to my hunt talk forum, you'll see my signature line says, you're going to run out of health before you run out of money. Yep. Hunt when you can. And I got that from a, a friend, a fellow CPA who was dying of cancer. We were close friends, and he called me and asked me if I'd take over some of his high net worth clients. And... When, when he called me, it was in October, he passed away on Halloween. He, it was one of those things where he, he didn't want to say it, I didn't want to say it, but you could tell this was like, hey, this is our last time. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, you know, and, and I can talk about it way easier now, 15 years after he's passed than I could at the t- time, but I'm like, you've been unbelievably successful you've you've done all this you've raised a wonderful family you, you've helped so many people uh you love you have certain passions in life what experience what, what advice would you have for me i'm 40 blah 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 and uh he says randy as much as you love to hunt trust me as someone who would really like to have more health and more time hunt when you can't because you're going to run out of health before you run out of money. And uh, I live by that. It's, uh, I, I know it, at the time it, it, it struck me, but it didn't really strike me the way that it did about a week later when he passed. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm staying home talking about hunting anymore. Yep. I'm going hunting. And so that's, that's my advice for anybody listening. Yep. Uh, you know, tomorrow never comes or whatever, whatever all those other cliches are. <laughs> Go on. 
So, and it's coming soon. It is. By the time people hear this podcast. Two months away. Yeah, even, well, this, Last, one, this yeah. one will drop probably in mid-July. Mid, mid to late July. Yeah, so six weeks, a, a month in some states. Yeah. yeah. Oh, goody, 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 goody. <laughs> I'm getting uh, excited thinking about how close it's going to be when this podcast comes out. And it's not I even know. that close right now. So. I know. Yeah. Well, folks, thanks for listening. Till the next time. Yep. We'll think up some more BS stories for you. Guaranteed. <laughs>